Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final day of the 45th Annual Conference on Oceans Law and Policy, UNCLOS at 40. It is an honor for me to be your MC. My name is Alif Imran Hidayat, and I'll be accompanying you throughout the day. This conference is conducted in a virtual format. Unfortunately, we would love to have you and our panelists here in Malaysia, but we have to follow the standard operating procedures implemented by the government. Our international speakers are joining us today through Zoom. Today, we have the last two sessions of the day, and I would argue the most interesting sessions of the conference. The first session is entitled Asymmetric Security Challenges and Regional Disputes. To our audience members today, if you have any questions for our speakers or even our moderator, please use the Q&A feature so that our panel can address them. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia is pleased to present our first moderator, Professor Felicity Attard from the University of Malta. Dr. Felicity G. Attard has for a number of years specialized in international law, including the Law of Sea, Maritime Security Law, Migration Law, Human Rights Law, and Refugee Rights Law. At the University of Malta, she read law and submitted her doctorate thesis, which dealt with the contribution of the International Maritime Organization to international law regulating maritime security. She has obtained a Master's of Law from the IMO International Maritime Law Institute and also at Queen Mary University. In 2019, she obtained a PhD for research on the duty to render assistance at sea under international law. Dr. Attard has participated in a number of international academies, including the International Foundation of the Law of the Sea Academy, Hamburg, and the Hague Academy of International Law. Dr. Attard is a member of the Faculty of Laws at the University of Malta, where she teaches and coordinates courses in international law, the law of the sea, and maritime security law. She has lectured at a number of universities and institutes, including the Center for Commercial Law Studies at the University of London, the International Ocean Institute, Harvard Law School, and the IMO International Maritime Law Institute. Professor Fosti Attard, the floor is now yours. Good day to all. Thank you, Ali, for that very kind introduction. I'm very pleased to have been invited to moderate this panel. At the outset, I would like to express my appreciation to the organizers of the conference, in particular, Professor Kraska, for bringing together such eminent speakers to form part of our panel. And given the expertise and knowledge of our panelists, I'm confident that we will have a very fruitful and thought-provoking session. The organizers have allocated 90 minutes to the panel. So I invite each panelist to speak for a maximum of 20 minutes. And in light of the full schedule, I would be grateful if the panelists do not go beyond the time allocated in order to ensure that we have enough time for questions at the end of the speakers list. I shall be raising my hand five minutes before the end of the time allocated as a gentle reminder. Questions will be received via the Q&A feature. And when posing questions, I invite you to state your name and your country. And it would also be helpful if you could indicate to whom you are addressing your question. So distinguished guests, I would like now to introduce our first speaker. B.A. Hamza, who is an expert in the study of geopolitics, maritime security, and the law of the sea. He has written extensively on maritime claims in the South China Sea. B.A. Hamza has undertaken research at leading academic institutions, such as the Lauter Park Center of International Law at Cambridge University and the UN Institute of Training and Research, UNITAR. Currently, he is a senior research fellow at the National Defence University of Malaysia. I now invite B.A. Hamza to address us on the topic of emerging technologies and future wars preliminary observations. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? No, can yes. you hear me? Well. All right, can you hear me? You there? It's good, it looks good. All right, yes. Great. Okay, uh, as I said earlier, thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator, for the introduction. Now, this is a topic of my presentation, Emerging Technologies and Future Wars, Preliminary Observations. Next slide, please. Next slide is just a, a caveat, actually. No, no, go back to the, the earlier slide, okay. What I want to say in this slide is actually to tell you that these are preliminary views on trends in future wars where emerging technologies may take over the cyberspace, the outer space, and even the traditional battlefields. We're talking about asymmetric warfare tools and techniques here. Now, I will give you two, uh, in fact, uh, during the discussion, we can have a discussion on the recent examples like the nagorno karabakh conflict in 2020 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? <laughs> Now, I find it's quite odd that we are discussing security and warfare in this conference that focuses on the 40th anniversary of uh, UNCLOS, but that is the brief given to me, so I'll stick to it. Now, I have actually provided two published commentaries to, to accompany my presentation. If you can request for your copy from the Secretariat. Now, the caveat is that I'm here in my own personal capacity. I do not represent anyone. Next slide, please. Now, this is a, for, for academics, for those who are interested to know more about this. This is my selected references for the uh, presentation. In particular, I'd like to highlight two, which I think uh, anybody who are keen to study on the emergent, emergent, uh, on this topic should consult. Now, what are you, what day is he going to do? What? The one is a, David Singer, the perfect weapon, war, sabotage. <clears throat> and the other one is Lauren Friedman. Friedman is actually the uh, emeritus professor at King's College. He's the doyen of the strategic studies. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we actually live in the very digital independent age where technologies are transforming rapidly the societies and the economy uh, and the economies of our nation states with unprecedented challenges to human security. Now, as of January 2021, for example, according to one source, there were 4.6 billion active internet users worldwide, which is which represent about 60% of the global population. Mm -hmm. And 93% of these people actually access the internet. By, via mobile devices almost on a daily basis. Now, technologies like uh, robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, which I'm going to say a few words on it, internet of things, autonomous systems, drones, and big data grow at a very exponential rate. And they have dual uses. That is a challenge. Use for the, they can be used for military purposes and they can be used for commercial purposes. So looking for a fine balance is always a challenge. But I, in my talk on this, I always say, follow the, the money tracks because money tops. The unpredictable security environment in the digital age is made worse by the absence of an international treaty on laws and rules governing their operation. This is the challenge that we all have when dealing with this AI and conversing. So AI technology is a challenge that no society, no single nation can successfully overcome. Next slide, please. Now, let me give you some general observation on trends in future wars. I make a distinction between future wars and the future of war. The two things are different. Yeah? We are talking about here is about future wars. But let me, we're talking about a third revolution in warfare, that is, from gunpowder through nuclear, and now the digitalized revolution on warfare. We're talking about digital warfare. 
So future war may involve, in my view, no soldiers at all, no weapons, and no battlefields at all. Think of cyber war, for example, and the use of artificial intelligence. If you want to wreak havoc on an enemy, all you need to do is to have a skilled coder, a half decent computer, and a working internet connection, and possibly a table robot. That's all you need, right? Now the current conflict over Ukraine testifies one likely trend in future war between states, but the essence of this will be its hybrid nature and its asymmetry nature. Now the Ukraine conflict did not, in my view, suddenly happen in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea, Crimea and occupied the eastern part of Ukraine. The war in Ukraine started in 1989 after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The invasion of Ukraine and its partitioning took place in 2014. On 21st February 2022, Russia recognized both the breakaway republics as independent states. A war attrition, attrition began and the final push started on January 26, 2022. Now we are witnessing the war. Okay, next slide please. <clears throat> war is about politics. Have you been reading the works of Clausewitz, Mahan, Corbett, and many other early strategic thinkers? They all insist that war is nothing more than an extension of politics by other means. In other words, state will use force in order to compel the enemy to submit to their will. And I, I put here Sun Tzu, uh, a Chinese uh, for this a strategic thinker who believe that in, uh, you can only break you, you can break the enemy's resistance without fighting, without wars. You know, very interesting uh, approach to uh, fighting wars. The targets for destruction in today's war include nations' critical infrastructure like power grid and power and uh, database, which is slightly different from what the previous uh, in previous conventional warfare setting. And all state parties and non-state parties in the Ukraine crisis, for example, use a combination of tools, information warfare, cyber attacks, AI, deception, or what, they, or what the Russian called Mariskova, and military force to gain the upper hand under the guise of diplomacy. All right, next slide, please. Now, cyberspace, in my view, exposes our vulnerabilities. The rapid change to the digital ecosystem has exposed our vulnerabilities facing the organization, cooperation, not only uh, uh, not, uh, uh, worldwide, but really global. Now, according to the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report for 2021, cyber risk is among the top global threats that need to be countered with agency. And we are all very vulnerable to cyber intrusion. And this dependency on the computer keeps increasing by the second. In 2020, there was a, there was a report to say that a staggering 31% of global companies were attacked by cyber criminals at least once per day. Over 1,000 companies have sensitive data stolen and publicly leaked by ransomware, for example, gangs. And even when you know, we go back after the pandemic to our offices, I think uh, we must expect that uh, this kind of uh, cyber attacks in our, uh, in our life, yeah? All right, next one. No, I think one must, understand that while the internet offers many benefits, its use also carries several safety and security risks. Connectivity and dependent on the cyberspace have made it all, all of us increasingly vulnerable. And our love or penchant for online activities from business to social networking activities have further exposed our vulnerability in the cyberspace. So my point is governments, NGOs, industries, individuals everywhere must work together in order to mitigate this risk by minimizing our vulnerability. 
While cooperation is the name of the game, states need laws, rules, and regulation to govern the activities in the lawless digital space. And that is the point that I want to drive home. Next one, please. Now, I want to go through this very quickly. As I'm suggesting here that artificial intelligence has dual uses. It's a two-edged sword. Now, the advent of modern AI will change the world. It, is a, it has a dual purpose. Now, the productive function of the, um, uh, the productive function, which is the commercial part of it, and the unpredictable function, which is the military role. So the advance of military AI is worrying, is worrying, is worried, has worried many people because where machines are set to do to slaughter innocent people. And there's a danger here because humankind, human beings are not able to control the machine. In my view, war is so destructive and a folly that humanity must avert at all costs. But, that's, but thus far, despite appeals and promises, no state has succeeded to beat weapons into plowshares. On the contrary, states have been perfecting the killing machine if there is, if, as if there is tomorrow. Right? Next slide, please. No. Artificial intelligence and weapons in cyberspace, for example, act as force multipliers. They can be used in order uh, to, multi uh, to make it that much more difficult to counter them. Now, let it give me give you some statistics. Yeah? The number of cyber attacks, according to one source, has risen by 180% between 2018 and 2019. This, is, this figure is two years back. The frequency of cyber attack is postulated to rise to 11 seconds in 2021, up from 14 seconds in 2019. These are all documented. Yeah? So although the, uh, the motivation for cyber attacks, like, like ransomware, for example, is mainly for financial gain, cyber weapons and animal weapons can pose immediate threat or collateral damage to innocent lives as the world has witnessed uh, uh, during the US withdrawal from Kabul uh, in uh, August, 2021. Now, the current situation in Ukraine speaks volume of the damage from clandestine cyber operation before and during the invasion. So as force multipliers and enablers, the weapons are among the most feared in, in the cyberspace and the outer space domain because it is not under the control of human beings. Okay, next one. Now, I, I just want to highlight this part because this is a UCAI, it's actually, a, it stands for United States Co National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. It was a report which was uh, uh, released last year, 2021. Uh, the, uh, this is a bipartisan uh, commission was headed by the former chief of uh, Google, Eric Smith. Now he highlighted the likelihood of rogue states, the criminals and their proxies using the AI in a cyberspace in future interstate conflicts. Now AI will be used in future interstate conflict. That is the message that you wanted to, uh, put, uh, to put across. The commission also notes that digital dependence has increased the vulnerabilities of every segment of the societies. Corporation, companies, government, institution, bureaucracies, as, far, as well as the private agencies. To cyber-based intrusion and by extension, to all the states and societies worldwide. Now, next one, please. Next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, here is a, 
what I want to uh, share with you very quickly in the interest of time is that uh, uh, one of the first conflicts in the 21st century, where we make use of this, uh, we call it lethal autonomous weapons, basically AI, in the 21st century is the recent nagorno karabakh war in 2020. The main players were Azerbaijan and Armenia. The associate players were Turkey, Russia, Israel, and Iran. Azerbaijan actually won the, uh, won the war in, uh, or rather the battle in, that, in the Nagorno-Karabakh incident. They used little autonomous weapons, which include a swarm of armed drones, including the kamikaze drones from Israel, known as Harab and Hapi, as well as Rotom, which is a, which is a, a vertically takeoff system they can loiter for 20 to 30 to 45 minutes with a maximum range of 10 kilometers. This is what we call it the kamikaze weapons. These are the loitering weapons that can kill. <clears throat> and Turkey, at the same time, sold killer drones to Azerbaijan, which were used effectively in Syria and Libya to put it back. Unfortunately, our friend from Armenia because they don't have that much of money, they were not able to purchase this thing. That was the thing that turned uh, uh, the table during the country because of the ability of Azerbaijan to make use of these little weapons, little autonomous weapons, the AI, uh, which had, uh, you know, brought them, gave them the victory. Okay, the next uh, slide, please. Can you go back to the, the slide before? Yeah, this is the, just to give you the picture of the uh, Nagorno Karabakh, uh, the map. Azerbaijan is on the right, as well as Armenia on the side. These are, they have been fighting each other for a long time. Uh, you know, as, as long as you can remember after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, you will call it. Yeah? So the area they were talking about is Nagorno Karabakh. All right, next slide. I just explained to you, and uh, this is one of the uh, loitering uh, kamikaze drone, Harab, no? which was bought from Israel and used in the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh incident, or rather war. Next one. This is not the picture of the loitering system. These are not men. These are all what we call it the uh, unmanned vehicles, virtually controlled. No? unmanned. So once they get the mission, they go straight for it. And once it's released, extremely, um, almost impossible to recall. And by the time you recall it, the damage has been done. You carry loitering munition. Next one. Now the challenges in the interest of time. Yeah? Now, I think we must accept that these emerging technologies are already embedded in our DNA of the end of our societies. We struggle very hard to keep up with the speed and range of change. So hence the challenge to policy planners. Now I'm using here ASEAN because I think this is much closer to, my, uh, to where I live, is that to develop regional, what I call it, collective mechanism to address the legal, particularly very important aspect, right? the ethical, the economic and the military footprint of the emerging digital technologies. That's the only way for us to minimize the unpool impact. Now, another challenge is how states, for example, should respond to accidental attacks, unintended or unplanned intrusion by proxies with criminal intention. But this is a challenge that uh, ASEAN states, for example, have to deal with, with the emerging technologies. Now, to be effective, these cooperative mechanisms, we have some mechanism, I think they must address the needs, not only of the military, but also the civil society, the government, the academia, the academia and the private sector in a very transparent, accountable, and inclusive way. All right, next one. Now, the areas of cooperation in ASEAN region, as I said, I want to focus on ASEAN, bring it closer home, 
because I think one of the things that you people are interested in is to look at the regional disputes. Now, while managing the cyberspace requires global cooperation, it calls for effective enforcement of the threat at the state, regional, as well as international level. In other words, what I'm saying to you, what I'm saying is, we all, we all have to work together at the state level, regional level, and the international level. Domestic laws can be used to mitigate internal threats or threats emanating from domestic sources. But strengthening international law and the norms governing would help improve resilience at the global level. Now, ASEAN member states should, in my view, collaborate, improving cybersecurity, and set up what I call it a regional cybersecurity action task force. I believe the, the political masters are thinking along this line. So we need to identify clearly and monitor and manage the risk together and should not, and I don't think we can work in solo, in silo rather, and act like a dog in a manger because that will not win the uh, war in the cyberspace or outer space. All right, next one. Now here is uh, why we need to focus on ASEAN. Firstly, it's because this is region in Southeast Asia. ASEAN stands for Association of East so of Southeast Asian Nations. The official function of ASEAN or purpose objective of ASEAN is to promote economic and cultural cooperation. But the uh, thing that got ASEAN together in 1967 was security. Because security was there because they, they provided the background for states to get together. Well, why ASEAN? Why is that? There must be, uh, uh, the focus is on ASEAN. Firstly, there is low cyber resilience as far as in ASEAN states. And ASEAN is quite rich, actually. The, G the G digital economy projected to hit three, one trillion dollars by 2030. So there's a lot of people are interested in stealing money and so many other things from ASEAN countries. And the other reason is because there's little coordination between member states on this issue. And therefore I think uh, as a way forward, we need to look at, at ASEAN and how we could progress together and improve the regional resilience. All right, last slide. Next slide. Well, the way forward is very simple. What I'm suggesting to you is that governments and business need to work closely. And that uh, we, have, we need to improve on cybersecurity and we need to have an organization which is overarching, which look at how we resolve or mitigate the threat on the cyberspace or the digital space together. All right, next slide. I think this is my last slide. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Miriam Hamza, for that very thought-provoking presentation. Distinguished guests, I now introduce our second expert speaker, Professor Yurika Ishii of the National Defense Academy of Japan, where she is in charge of Law of the Sea and Public International Law courses. She's the author of the book, Japanese Maritime Security and the Law of the Sea, which analyzes Japanese national security laws at sea. And she has agreed to address us on the interesting subject of the development of the Coast Guard laws in Asian region and its implication on the asymmetric security challenge. Professor Ishii, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Haddad. First of all, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the organizers for having me in this annual conference on law, ocean law and policy. It is, my, it is my honor and privilege to be a part of this prestigious event with distinguished participants. So today um, I will talk about the recent updates of the Coast Guard laws in Southeast Asia and East Asia region, uh, which attach the law enforcement agencies by the mandates. Uh, uh, and uh, let me share the slide uh, while I speak. <clears throat> so I hope uh, that it shows well. Okay, so here's the outline of uh, today's talk. Um, and 
I, I, will, I, I would argue uh, that uh, the recent updates of the Coast Guard laws would create the asymmetry of the domestic legal structure among these states, and it may enlarge the risks of incidents at sea. And then I'd like to talk about the limits of the convention, uh, the UNCLOS, uh, with a special focus on the dispute settlement procedure of, uh, the, the, of UNCLOS. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we are all familiar, um, I, I, I could assume, uh, about the legality or, or the it rules uh, concerning the coercive measures under uh, international law uh, when the law enforcement agencies exercises their uh, power. Let's see. So first we have to comply with the United Nations Charter, of course, and then uh, we have to comply uh, with the rules uh, under the law of the sea especially the zonal approach, <clears throat> you know, states can, uh, the, the convention provides what state can, states can do uh, in each maritime column. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we have the rules on the use of force in the law enforcement measures. Uh, I mean, there, there are some, some, some uh, I mean, plenty of writings on it, but uh, I, I'd like to just refer to it last, uh, which said that the use of force must be avoided, and if if unavoidable, it must not go beyond what is reasonable and necessary, and consideration of humanity must apply. Now, um, here, uh, the idea uh, of the studies on the law of the sea is that the, the legal regime is based on the inclusivity. Now, uh, famously, uh, professors McDougall and Burke uh, said uh, that the, 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 the idea of the maritime order is based on the so-called the common interests of states. And uh, the emphasis has been uh, on retaining inclusive enjoyment of ocean space. And you know, uh, it only permits exclusive claims to prevail uh, if they serve the common interests where the impacts of the use uh, are especially critical for the particular state and the restrictions upon inclusive use are kept to the minimum. So the, the idea is based on uh, the so-called the freedom of the sea. Now, uh, the recent trends in Southeast Asian and East Asian countries may show that states tend to claim potentially excessive and exclusive maritime entitlement, uh, and it may be beyond what is permissible under the UNCLOS. And uh, the, the, those states authorize their coast guards to protect such interests. Now, it, 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 it deserves a close examination, uh, but uh, the, e, 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 the research uh, on the domestic laws of these, of, of these countries shows uh, that trend and uh, the, I'd, I'd argue that the asymmetry of the domestic legal structure may create the risk of the conflict at sea. Now, uh, to show where my interest comes from, uh, I'm looking at the Senkaku situation. Now, uh, the graph shows uh, the number of the Chinese uh, government, government ships entering into the territorial sea of the Senkaku Islands. Uh, and, uh, I, I assume that you, you all know, but uh, this, this uh, both China and Japan claim the territorial title of this small island. And it, it is located in, in, in a geo geopolitically, geopolitically important uh, point. And uh, after Japanese government bought the, these islands, uh, China sends uh, the, the, the ships uh, and uh, that creates uh, the situation where the Chinese Coast Guard vessels and Japanese Coast Guard vessels confront with each other uh, in the Tinto Yale Sea or the contiguous zones of the islands. Now, uh, when you look at the e, 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 domestic laws, uh, meaning you know, uh, the e, e mandates of the Coast Guards uh, of each state, uh, there is a clear uh, difference between the two states. Now, uh, Japanese Coast Guard 
authorities is uh, uh, based on the Japan Coast Guard law. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the state authorities, uh, I mean, the state police authorities are under a strict statutory regulation when it uses weapons against people within the Japanese territory. Uh, I assume that it is the case in, in every democratic state. Now, uh, the Coast Guard law depends on the law concerning the execution of duties of police officials, uh, which authorizes uh, the, the land polices uh, to exercise the weapons. So they, they use the same standards uh, with the land police uh, when it comes to the law enforcement at sea. So that creates uh, the certain limits uh, for the Japanese Coast Guard. Now, on the other hand, uh, China established uh, the new Chinese Coast Guard law in 2012, 2021, uh, and uh, CCG is explicitly authorized to protect its islands. Uh, and and uh, a, the e, e, e law authorizes CCG to use coercive measures uh, to stop foreign organizations and individuals from constructing buildings or structures uh, Etc. Uh, e, e, on, on islands, which includes uh, Senkaku Islands, and and also uh, the e, e law authorizes CCG to coercively evict or tow point warships and government ships used for non-commercial purposes from jurisdictional maritime area, uh, etc. So that that may apply to Senkaku Island situation as well. So. Uh, <clears throat> So we, we have to look at uh, the elements of the country's maritime security law, which includes uh, the mandates of the Coast Guards and the Navy uh, and uh, their relationship, uh, the maritime entitlement uh, that each state claim, and the standard for the use of weapons. Now, let me go through the recent updates of Coast Guard laws in Southeast Asia and in East Asia. And uh, I have to disclose first that I don't read uh, the language of most of the states, so I had to rely on English materials. If I'm wrong, um, please let me know. Um, so, so as far as I know, uh, the states have updated uh, the Coast Guard laws <clears throat> um, recently. And, mostly in the late 2010s. Uh, it is not only China, but also uh, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Republic of Korea uh, updated their, their Coast Guard laws. And uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, you know, uh, well, the Indonesia is trying to update their capabilities and the Philippines uh, issued the new uh, protocol for the use of force. Now, uh, the, 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 a number of countries uh, we organized the Coast Guard agencies uh, to, to, to clarify their mandates uh, or uh, expand uh, their authorities. Uh, and uh, China, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam explicitly authorized the law enforcing agencies to protect its maritime security and sovereignty. Now, these are not an issue uh, from the legal perspective. But when you think about the traditional role of the Coast Guard, uh, which is to, to, to protect its territory, uh, and uh, they, they are you know, supposed to enforce its domestic law, uh, attaching the mandate to protect sovereignty seems to be a step further. Now, uh, the, the other thing that I noticed is that they, some of the countries use the concept of the maritime zone, uh, which does not exist in, in UNCLOS. Now, China uses the concept of jurisdictional maritime zone, uh, which includes not only international, uh, internal water, territorial sea, but also contiguous zone EZ, continental shelf. Sorry, I, it, it is supposed to be CS. Uh, continental shelf and uh, so-called other jurisdictional waters subject to China's jurisdiction. It also includes the air above the zone. So potentially it includes a very wide uh, area. Now, uh, Malaysia 
Thailand, Vietnam also uses the term maritime zone, uh, and it treats all the maritime column in, in one category. So that, that concerns me because uh, the e, 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 territorial sea and the e, maritime column beyond the territorial sea is different uh, from the international law perspective. Uh, and also the e, Malaysia and Thailand includes the area above the zone. So that includes the e, 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 airspace above EZ, uh, which is, seems to be excessive. Now, Japan and the e e Republic of Korea authorizes their Coast Guard to enforce their laws at sea. So uh, we have to look at the e laws that they are enforcing uh, because it doesn't, using the term at sea doesn't mean that the, the, the claims are excessive. Uh, and also Indonesia and the Philippines relies on the zone uh, Especially, they they they, they distinguish uh, the territorial sea and the waters beyond the territorial sea. Although they, uh, in Indonesia does not use this term uh, that is used in the Anglos. Uh, what concerns me is uh, that some states allow the Coast Guard to you know uh, evict foreign ships beyond the zones. So we've looked at the Chinese Coast Guard laws, uh, which seems to be excessive uh, if they enforce CCG Act, uh, as it states. But also Malaysia uh, authorizes the, e, 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 the, the, the agency to expel any vessel which ha it has reason to believe to be detrimental to the interest of or to endanger the order and safety in Malaysian maritime zone. Now, uh, Angos does not recognize the security interests in, in, in EZ, so it seems to be excessive. Uh, also, Thailand National Interest uh, Protect, Protection Act <clears throat> uh, authorizes uh, the e, 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 Thai agency to act the, to, to protect the security interests in, in, in EZ. So uh, these are the trends that I'm concerned. Uh, now, uh, we've looked at the criteria of Saiga case. Uh, some domestic laws seems to be uh, excessive in light of the use of uh, the, the criteria of the use of use of weapons. Uh, Chinese Coast Guard law uh, authorizes CCG to, to use weapons under certain conditions. Uh, it seems to me that uh, they they omit the requirement to give the prior warning. Uh, and there seems to be no complementary requirement in the humanity principle uh, uh, at the, on the text of the law. Now, in, in practice, it might be different, but uh, as far as I can see from the act, uh, it seems to be excessive uh, in, in light of the criteria uh, that it lost held in Saiga case. Now, uh, Vietnam also uh, provides the criteria for the use of weapons in detail. Uh, and uh, as long as I look at the text of the DDEE Act, uh, there seems to be no explicit provision on the reasonable, reasonableness, complementary, and human, humanity requirements. So, uh, if, so, so this kind of expansion uh, of Coast Guard laws may create uh, the disputes among the law enforcement agencies. So uh, lastly, let me briefly go through the limits of the dispute settlement of the UNCLOS. So uh, as we have seen in the last two days, uh, UNCLOS has robust uh, judicial settlement mechanism, uh, but it does have some limits. Uh, of course, it doesn't apply to the territorial dispute. So uh, for instance, it, it won't, it, it won't uh, apply to the Senkak situation, I, I, I assume. I, I mean, I, I, I might be wrong, but it, if the court has to decide the territorial title, then it is out of the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Now, uh, the other limits is that states can you know, opt out the compulsory jurisdiction that is, that is provided in, in, in part 15 of the UNCLOS. And one of them is uh, the so-called uh, military activities exception. 
uh, which, which is provided Article 298-1B. Now, uh, so, so countries can opt out disputes concerning military activities and law enforcement activities uh, with regard to the exercise of uh, sovereign rights and jurisdiction exclusive from, from the jurisdiction of, of a court under Article 297, Paragraph 2 or 3. And that includes uh, the sovereign rights with respect to the living resources in the EZ. Uh, in the region, uh, China, the Republic of Korea, and Thailand excludes uh, the military activities and law enforcement activities as provided in this paragraph. Uh, and so, so, so in, in other words, is the other countries accept uh, the court's jurisdiction uh, with this regard. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I think it is worth it to look at the case laws uh, concerning the interpretation of the military activities exception. Now, uh, in, in short, uh, the judgment and decisions are not consistent. I mean, there are not so many um, and it, they are not consistent. Uh, the bottom line is that the status of the interfering vessel, uh, I mean, the law enforcement vessel is not determined. So whether it is a warship or a Coast Guard ship, it doesn't matter. It could be uh, uh, in military activities, even if the Coast Guard uh, enforces its law. Now, uh, in, in South China Sea arbitration, uh, the, e, 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 there are two points. Uh, one is uh, whether uh, the Chinese land reclamation activities is included in this exception. And uh, the court looked at the statements of the Chinese uh, officials and uh, which, which repeatedly, repeatedly stated that its installations and island building activities are not intended to, uh, as, I'm sorry, the, the, these activities are intended to fulfill civilian purposes. And uh, the court said that if, you know, Chinese officials say so, it is civilian purpose, it is for civilian purposes and it is not military activities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when it comes to the standoff between the Philippines armed forces and Chinese Coast Guard, uh, Coast Guard <clears throat> The court said uh, that uh, the e existence of uh, the military vessels and the confrontations between the two, two, two states uh, represents a quint essentially military situation. And uh, therefore, the court said that it did not have jurisdiction over this issue. Uh, when it comes to it loss, uh, three Ukraine vessels. Uh, the court issued provisional measures uh, when Russia detained uh, three Ukraine naval vessels in Cage Strait. <clears throat> and the court had to deal with whether it had the prima facie jurisdiction. Uh, and it was said that uh, the, 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 all the context and events preceding the arrest and detention and it concluded that it occurred in the context of law enforcement operation rather than a military operation. And therefore the article 298-1B does not, did not apply. Now, it, it is for the prima, prima facie jurisdiction, so it, it's not conclusive, uh, but, but, but in, in any event, I would, I, I would argue that the court, uh, you know, uh, made, applied a very loose uh, standards uh, when, it, when it comes to the, the deciding its jurisdiction. Now, lastly, uh, the coastal state rights uh, before an X7 arbitral tribunal is, uh, looked at the functions and the nature of the activities uh, to exclude the application of this product to, to this, this article. Uh, and, <clears throat> It also decided the law enforcement activities ex exception, uh, and it held that the both sovereign character of the rights uh, and the entitlement of, of the declaring state to the area in question uh, must be objectively established for the optional exception to apply. And since uh, the law enforcement activities alleged, uh, but, but, uh, alleged by Russia occurred within the area, that cannot be determined to constitute uh, the EEZ of either state, uh, the tribunal excluded the application of this program. 
So uh, in short, uh, I mean, there, there's not so many case laws and, 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 and they're not consistent, but we know that, I mean, we know that from the text of town laws that the status of the e -E -E vessel is not an, an issue. But anyway, uh, the e -E -E, because of we have the e -E situation of where the e -E agencies might confront with each other, the escalation management, uh, self-interest and deterrence is necessary to avoid unnecessary conflicts. And uh, the countries should maintain the rule of law, both in the context of diplomacy and the national maritime security policy. So that concludes my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ishii for that very knowledgeable presentation. I now invite our final speaker, Dr. Kamal Dean Ali, who is the Executive Director of the African Center for Maritime Law and Security. He has taught at a number of international institutions and his book, Maritime Security Cooperation in the Gulf of Guinea, Prospects and Challenges, is rated as a significant contribution to the knowledge of the subject. His presentation entitled Asymmetric Maritime Threats and Fragile States, Vectors, Participants and Targets. Dr. Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Atad, for the kind introduction. And I thank, um, following the steps of the previous speakers, um, the organizers of this um, wonderful workshop um, and seminar, an, an annual activity that um, enriches um, our experience collectively. Uh, the Naval War College, um, in particular led by Professor Kraska, uh, the World Maritime University and the Ma Malaysian Institute of, of, of Maritime Affairs and other stakeholders. Uh, I enjoyed very much the presentations by uh, Professor Hamza and uh, Ishi, and I think uh, what I'm going to do just follow up from that, but uh, much more looking at fragile states. Okay, so <clears throat> why are we talking about fragile states um, in this context? Um, we all know that we have a vast maritime space. And um, this maritime space actually means that we are in the water world. In other words, over 70% of the world is sea area. And what that means is that whatever collectively we do as states um, impact on the governance of the maritime space. And it also means that if we have asymmetric threats in the maritime space, that is going to be significant. There are increasing threats across the threshold uh, both on land and at sea. And at one point, we can talk about threats that take the nature of war. But again, we can look at threats that are significant. And Professor Hamza has mentioned many of them uh, that do not take the nature of war, but that effect is going to be even much more higher than that of war. We have a global interdependency. Um, the maritime space itself is a creature of this interdependency. Um, it locks us all into a unit, provides mobility, and within this mobility, you have what we call trace. But as indicated by the previous speaker, Professor Hamza, we are also connected uh, to a digital spectrum. And what that means now is that at any point in time, we have a single globe. Now, within this maritime space and within the global maritime commons, you have different states that are at different levels. You have states that are at very high level. They are very much stable. They have a lot of capability, despite the fact that they are not immune from threats. You have middle level states that have also got significant capacity and capability. And at the bottom of it, you have what I would call fragile states. So three level of states are participants in the global commons and in the maritime space. The first level of states that are very much sophisticated, very stable, uh, middle level states and then fragile states. Yet, all these states are connected in the maritime space. Um, if we were dealing with um, an environment where we had just only land and in between the land we had nothing at all, 
then we would have said that these states are not connected. But from the stronger to the weaker state, we are connected in one space. So that means that as we discuss asymmetric threats, although some aspect of those threats may be of interest to some states because they are able to secure some levels of the asymmetric threats, but we need to also focus and discuss it collectively. So it is this regard that I want us to focus a bit more on what I call the fragile states. So what are the symptoms of these fragile states? We can discuss that at the um, uh, strategic and tactical level, but for now, I want to focus on one strategic and operational level. Uh, what you see in blue are some of the symptoms of this fragile states. And what you see in gray are the operational Fragility. So you have both strategic fragilities and you have operational uh, uh, fragil uh, fragilities. Uh, for example, you talk about at the highest level that leadership may not have the requisite awareness and they may not even be collective leadership stability. Um, the political world may be lacking in order to spend in the maritime space and the awareness and the understanding may not be there. At, the strategic documentary level, there may be lack of strategy or policy that will help these states govern their maritime space. Funding will be inadequate, and then there will be less cooperation with neighbors, with, the region, uh, with um, uh, regional actors, and globally, the structures of cooperation may be very weak. So these are some of the many strategic challenges that confront fragile states. Then at the operational level, there's lack of technology in many of these fragile states. Uh, law, in terms of a governance instrument, is either inadequate or unavailable. Capability is lacking. Intelligence um, structures and facilities are inadequate. There are many institutional gaps at the national level. People tend to work in silos. And expertise is highly undercut, so there's not much expertise because of other challenges, including funding. Technology that is needed, uh, for example, to ensure that there is surveillance in the maritime space is very limited. And for that matter, uh, building the requisite maritime domain awareness and the uh, requisite um, recognizable uh, picture for maritime operation is less. So given this combination of strategic deficit and operational challenges that strategic, uh, that fragile states are faced with, there is a huge concern with maritime governance. So this maritime governance, which is a major deficit in, in fragile states, should be a concern just not to the fragile states, but to regional states and the global community. So following from that, you tend to see a number of threats in fragile states. And those threats are increasing. They may be of the nature of traditional asymmetric threats, or they are threats that may be described as maritime asymmetric threats, but their impact is very huge. We have seen the case of piracy, for example, in the um, um, Indian Ocean, and the fact that uh, the fragilities of Somalia and neighboring Indian Ocean states uh, made this a major concern. So this is where you see a clear link between a fragile, unstable state and what become what I'll call the second order of what I call asymmetry threats. Insurgency can be a problem and it can come out of many things. Uh, for example, in the case of Nigeria, we saw how the movement for emancipation of Niger Delta mutated from a civil um, um, consent group to become an insurgent group. And that also became um, a major actor in the maritime security and especially piracy profile across the Gulf of Guinea. And that is still a major challenge. In fragile states, because of the instability, you have terrorism. And if you look at the fragile states of West Africa in particular, terrorism has been eaten from the Sahel. And this is a major concern to most coastal states. We do not necessarily see that, um, that there's too much interest in maritime assets by terrorists 
But if terrorists are able to overrun most of the Sahel states and move towards the coastal states, and it is a distance away now, it increases the spectrum of threats that we are dealing with. Drug trafficking comes in. First, something that undermines global governance, but the fact that those that are acting in the asymmetric world, um, rogue persons, can use drug trafficking, profit from it, and then be able to build huge capital that can help them in destabilizing the global community. You have illicit cargo, and this can easily find its way into fragile states because there's lack of capacity, there's lack of monitoring, only a few of containers at any point in time are screened, and which means that one from somewhere, um, 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 weapons of mass destruction or others can be delivered to a fragile state and can then be used at the fragile state uh, with, with, with little or no monitoring, and this can endanger the rest of the world. Cyber crime is something that is global, but small boats are uh, the very nature of fragile states is said that they depend at a lower level. A um, lot of fishing takes place, uh, but there are a lot of smaller boats and rogue vessels, especially fishing vessels, and you find them all over crisscrossing the maritime space of the fragile states, but going into the exclusive economic zone, going into the um, uh, the high seas, and this pose a major a, a, a lot of threat. Uh, most of these boats are, are not well monitored. Um, there are not, um, if you want, communication or surveillance equipments in them that allow them to be tracked, and which means that we are actually operating in the dark spot or in the dark area. And what this means, especially from the Gulf of Guinea experience, is that once a boat gets into the water, it can do many things and detecting it can be a major challenge. We have vulnerable offshore oil and, uh, 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 platforms. It is interesting that um, in most of the fragile states, especially if you come to West Africa, um, that there is a beginning um, uh, offshore exploration and what it means is that we are having this huge global investments that cost uh, millions of dollars that are floating all over the water. Yes, industry is able to secure them to some extent, but it requires the state and state resources to provide another layer of security for such uh, vulnerable offshore platforms. And hitting one vulnerable uh, platform can be a major challenge. We saw it in 2014, where a strike at the Banga oil platform of Nigeria uh, led to two, three, four, and by a week, uh, $5 of increase per barrel of oil globally. And this is very significant. And beaches that are part of the recreational activities um, are, are largely unsecured. And what it means is that citizens that are on holidays and uh, visitors that are on holidays and citizens can be open to a number of threats. So these are a number of threats that may not really matter in the, in the kinetic sense of states, but when it comes to fragile states, um, they are very, very significant. And yes, not significant to the fragile states, but there's that interrelationship with the global community and they can impact on the security of the maritime commons globally. So how do this play out? It means that in the case of fragile states, we can see three elements. And this is what I argue initially and something we have to build on. The fragile states can serve as vectors of asymmetric traits. Vectors either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, they are vectors because of the fragilities and much of it that we have seen that they suffer from. It means that through fragile states, the global community and the global um, maritime space can be undermined significantly. So that is where they serve as vectors. They serve as participants, and they serve as participants at times unintentionally. Unintentional because they may be the host to, um, if you are rogues, and these rogues may even find their way to the higher levels of the fragile states. And uh, because of lack of intelligence, because of lack of capacity, you may never be able to understand what their uh, motives are, and for that matter, the fragile states become unwilling participants. But also in the sense that as much as fragile states are not able to offer robust ocean governance, they become the weaker link in the chain. 
And for that matter, they become participants, if you want, in the asymmetric trust of the uh, maritime trust of the global community. But they are also targets because at the end of the day, they are victims uh, because of lack of capacity. They can be used in a way that is prejudicial to their interest, but in a way that will undermine even their ability uh, to grow and to use the maritime commons. For example, when it comes to drug trafficking, when it comes to illicit um, uh, trafficking of weapons, we have seen that many at times fragile states become targets in many ways and this undermine the uh, So these three uh, are the arguments that my preliminary work is looking at to see how fragile states become vectors of asymmetric maritime threats, to see how they are participants and how ultimately they are targets. So what is the way forward? Uh, looking forward, we don't have to go beyond uh, many of the traditional instruments that we have. What we have to do is to see how we, if you want, escalate and make better use of this, those traditional instruments. We need greater information sharing. Um, uh, we, we need to just accept it, that we have one global community. And for that matter, make information sharing as much available as possible. I do know that there are certain protocols that always uh, prevent, especially intelligence sharing. And what that means is that you are having fragile states that lack the requisite information, and yet their contribution to maritime governance is important, just not for them, but for the global community. So we need greater information sharing. We need to um, support many of the fragile states to have robust uh, maritime policy and strategic, uh, strategic frameworks. A number of these are coming up, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. And we have to make sure that the whole of government approach and integration is built into these strategies. We need greater awareness and greater maritime domain awareness in particular. And that will mean that technology is, is, is required, coastal radars, um, um, access to coastal radars, but more importantly, uh, satellite imagery, and this can help build the requisite information that is required. Um, two things I will want to conclude with, one is capacity and capability. Uh, capacity, uh, capability in the terms of what platforms and what technology is available, but also the capacity to operate that and to use that effectively in dealing with the asymmetric threats that fragile states are confronted with, and that will mean a greater contribution of fragile this effort to the global community. And finally, greater ocean governance. Better understanding of the ocean space, um, laws and policies all help in, in, in the governance and integrating everything together effectively will mean that we have a better maritime governance and fragile states will be beneficiaries of the intended benefits of the ocean space as much as they become contributors to our collective security and limiting uh, the number of asymmetric threats that undermine the global community in the maritime space. So thank you very much. So these are my talks on um, initial work that is going on. Um, and I'm very happy to have participated in this particular forum. Thank I am also open much. to questions and discussions at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for your very insightful presentation. I now open the floor to questions. I believe the first one is from Professor Kraska to Dr. Hamza. UNCLOS avoided security issues raised by Arvid Pardo, and those were addressed separately through the Seabed Nuclear Treaty. But IMO has advanced maritime security law, including the 2005 SUA Convention, and the UNGGE is focused on regulating lethal autonomous weapons. How would, the IM, how would the IMO member states or other international organization approach development of standards for emerging naval technologies such as autonomous fleets, use of AI and cyber? So I invite Dr. Hamza to answer. I believe you are muted. Uh, 
Thank can you, you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, good. There's a question from Professor Kraska. It's a $64,000 question. Very difficult. Uh, well, let me just uh, uh, try to sort of uh, answer his questions if I can. Firstly, we're talking about what we call this um, autonomous weapons at sea or autonomous, autonomous system at sea, whether it is in the seabed, whether in the high sea, or rather the high sea is less of a problem, but also in the uh, EZ of other countries. Now that part is not mentioned in UNCLOS. I think that is one lacuna that uh, UNCLOS has to deal with now, because when we were establishing the order for the sea from 1973 or 1958 back to 1982, at that moment, there was no development or technological development in that area. So that is a problem now. I think we need to look into the autonomous system and there must be some kind of rules and regulation with regard to their uses at sea. Now, bear in mind that if you Article 300 and Article 301 of UNCLOS, yeah? Article 300 uh, and, 300 and 301 supplement each other. That is, the sea is to be used for good order. Now, in other words, uh, there, is, there must be a responsibility on the part of the users of the ocean to, for order at sea. Now, if you go back to the preamble the, the primary language of the of convention, it also speaks uh, of the need to establish order at sea. So if we reckon that all these new technologies are going to create some kind of harmful effect on the order at sea, and I think there must be uh, discussion to produce rules and regulation. Now, autonomous vehicle, autonomous system is only one of the gaps or one of the lacuna that we have in uh, law of the sea, you know, uh, other things like uh, genetic materials, uh, development of new species at sea, which were not covered before, and so many other things. That is, a, uh, I think that will be covered in a different section. But I just want to, uh, the point that I'm making is that, yes, I think we need to look into some kind of regulation uh, pertaining to the uses of this uh, autonomous system. Now, bear in mind, this is we're talking about for military purposes. You know, in military, marine science, for example, we use subs, submersible. That has been allowed, that's been going on for a long time. So, but it is the military component of the AI, which I discussed earlier, because of the dual nature that I think we have to have uh, regulation on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take the next question for Dr. Ishi from Henry Junior Ben Surto, who thanks you for your presentation and asks, what is the existing state practice and case law with respect to a, fo to a foreign exercise of sovereign patrol into the EEZ of another coast state? Would such activities by the Coast Guard of a foreign country subject to the exceptions under Article 298 of UNCLOS? Uh, thank you for 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 the question. <clears throat> um, now, um, this existing state practice in the case law with respect to to a foreign exercise of sovereign patrol in into EZ and of another sovereign coastal state. Now, <clears throat> now, it, of course, it depends on 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 the e, 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 e activities of the foreign. Uh, vessels uh, patrolling into the EZ, but basically, uh, the e, e, every state every state enjoys the freedom of the high, freedom of the use of seas seas in in a foreign EZ. So uh, under UNCLOS, uh, the the these other states can exercise uh, their uh, their their rights uh, to to pursue the security operations in, in a foreign EZ. Now, I do not recall uh, the e, e case laws uh, concerning uh, this point, but uh, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to, to elaborate uh, the possible 
uh, standards for, for the e, 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 e exclusions of military activities uh, of Article 298. Um, I got uh, another question from Professor Kraska uh, to, to how, how we can distinguish uh, the South China Sea and uh, it losses uh, position. Now, now, now um, I would say that uh, they took different uh, position on the interpretation of Article 298, uh, Paragraph 1b. Uh, obviously, uh, the South China Sea Arbitration Tribunal would have decided that uh, the seizure of another military vessel would constitute the military activities and, and therefore the, 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 tri the, church, the tribunal uh, did not have the jurisdiction. And it lost, uh, on the other hand, stated that it was a law enforcement activity and therefore it is not ex 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 excluded from the jurisdiction. Now, uh, one thing that I uh, would concur with the it losses approach is that uh, the, the, the tribunal supported that uh, the decision has to be made in an objective manner. It doesn't, you know, exclude the, 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 the case from its jurisdiction just because the state argued that it was a military activity. But on the other hand, uh, I would say that the it lost took a very low standard uh, and uh, <clears throat> You know, I uh, try to you know distinguish the military activities from law enforcement activities, but in that process, uh, it looked actually looked at uh, the 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 sorry um the context of the e, e, e activities and uh, did not clearly show the e distinguish. The, 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 the clearly show the line uh, to, to, to distinguish uh, those two activities. So um, I and, and also I, I also have to add that the, the reason why this exception is included in the UNCLOS is that the states wanted to reserve their rights uh, to to exercise its their military activities at sea, uh, and they did not want. I mean, they at least wanted to. To, to leave the room for, for states uh, to opt out from the compulsory jurisdictional mechanism when it comes to the, the activities concerning uh, the, 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 the uh, military operations. So uh, concerning that, the, 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 the reason why uh, this provision is in the, in the treaty, uh, I, I think that the, the, the threshold should be high enough uh, for, for the stability of the court system. Uh, so I would argue that, you know, the, the, the standards for, for the e, e, e jurisdiction should be higher than the, 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 the it laws. On the other hand, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, it was a provisional measures decision and the court did not go through the full review. Uh, so that might justify uh, the conclusion of the tribunal. Thank you, Professor Aichi. The next question is from Abdul Dash to Dr. Ali. Why do African countries such as Somalia and Kenya spend an enormous amount of resources to resolve their insignificant maritime related border disputes all the way to the international court? Is there any other easy way to resolve maritime issues or disputes among African countries? Thank you very much uh, for that question. And that raises a very interesting, um, uh, if you want, um, aspects of, 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 of African states. On the one hand, um, we are seeing um, very great commitment of African states, despite their fragilities, to global institutions. Um, we have seen that um, there's readiness to use it loss, for example, uh, by African states, and there's great uh, readiness to use um, ICJ by African states. So in a way, it is very positive because 
If we look at the spectrum of instruments that are available to a state, uh, starting with conflict to uh, diplomacy, um, resorting to judicial means is one of the, the most positive ways. So it shows this positive inclination of African states to um, use uh, judicial processes, global judicial processes to resolving issues. But I do agree with the question that it is, um, it is something that um, also saps the energy of the African states and create greater issues ahead. I think one of the problems is if you look at um, um, the case of Somalia, and, and each case can be peculiar, but if you look at the case of Somalia and that of um, Kenya, it's an overlay of issues that make the diplomatic option um, one that is not uh, at least um, it's, it's not something that is attractive to Somalia um, because they have a lot of dis uh, disputes already, including conflict on border, land border issues. Uh, there's cross security concerns. So what it means is that um, um, there are existing issues that make the resort to diplomacy and settlement of the issue bilaterally less likely. And that's then also pushes them to this level. I think secondly also, the oil and gas interest is always a major factor. Um, the oil and gas interest look for certainty within a very short time. So once you have oil and gas interest in the case, for example, of Ghana uh, versus Cote d'Ivoire, my own country, or in the case of Somalia versus Kenya, um, the oil and gas interests don't have this patience for a long protracted boundary this, uh, negotiation. So the states are then pushed into a situation where they are looking for results, uh, results in a very quicker way or resolution in a quicker way. And diplomacy would take many years to do that. So pushed by this collectivity of concerns, then um, um, resort to adversarial means using the um, uh, international uh, judicial processes becomes what uh, the states will opt for. So the solution is one, um, to preempt such um, disputes and solve them ahead before you are pushed into the situation where you have to make quick economic considerations and that will let you opt out for, opt for advers adversarial approach and the second one is that, yes, uh, we have the African Boundary Management Commission and the, then the Management Commission or the Boundary Commission uh, can be used at an early stages to make sure that such boundary issues are also resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. I'll take the final question um, since we have a limitation of time. This is from Raga Maniari from MIMA. It's also addressed to Dr. Ali. Are there any regional cooperative mechanisms to combat asymmetric maritime threats in the African region, like the Malacca Straits Patrol between littoral states of the Straits of Malacca or RECA pioneered by Japan to tackle piracy in Southeast Asian maritime domain? Yes, they are. Thank you very much for the question. They are. And in many ways, they are actually much more robust and, and, and much more developed than what you have in RECAP. Um, you have the Djibouti um, arrangement that deals with the Indian Ocean region and um, under the IMO, and quite a lot has been happening. Um, for the last uh, decade, or almost getting to a decade now, you have the Yawundi Code of Conduct that has created what we call the YAMS, the Yaoundi Architecture for Maritime Security in the Gulf of Guinea. And that is what much more well structured than what you have in RECAP, because you have the whole region that is divided into zones and you actually have officers and personnel that are posted from one country to, to another. So for example, you have zones um, A to zones G and in each of these zones, uh, you have about four or five countries, including the landlocked states um, that are posted and they monitor a zone and then look into the maritime space of the zone. 
um, the challenge, of course. Okay, so again, uh, this is a very positive thing that um, despite all the sovereignty uh, challenges, you have readiness of the countries to come together to have offices in one building, um, all across from um, Cape Verde down to Angola, and they will be monitoring their maritime space. The challenge is still is, is, is one of capacity. So they need to expand capacity, and that is part of the dis discussion that is taking place in Dakar, where I am. And the other challenge is um, to also uh, move beyond um, the, the focus on piracy to deal with other asymmetric threats uh, that do not necessarily uh, are not piracy, but which are below the radar now, and there's not too much attention yet. So you may wish to read a bit more about the Yaoundi, architect uh, the Yaoundi architecture and its implementation, as well as the Djibouti Code of Conduct and its implementation. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much. So I wish to thank all the panelists for their very stimulating and knowledgeable contributions which have offered unique insights into the asymmetric challenges uh, in various regions of the world. So it's interesting that we covered current and future security challenges, focusing on regional issues in uh, Asia and Africa. And finally, I would like to congratulate the core sponsors for organizing this conference, which I am confident will be a landmark in the worldwide celebrations of UNCLOS's 40th anniversary. So thank you very much. And I now hand the floor to Alif. I would like to thank our moderator, Professor Felicity Attar, and our speakers today for their informative presentations and fascinating exchange of ideas regarding asymmetric security challenges and regional disputes. We are now on to the next session. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia is pleased to welcome Dato Muhammad Sufyan Awa, Chairman of MIMA, to deliver the keynote address for session seven. Dato Muhammad Sufyan Awa was born in 1971 in Kuantan, Pahang, graduated with LLB honors, Mara University of Technology, UITM, and he was also the political secretary to the former Prime Minister of Malaysia and a former special officer to the Malaysian Special Envoy Ministerial Rank to the United States of America from 2013 to 2015. He is now the chairman of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia. Dr. Mohamed Sofian Awang, the floor is now yours. Professor Jim Kraska, chairman of uh, Stockton Center for International Law. Professor uh, uh, Felicity Atta, University of Malta. Professor B.A. Hamza, National Defense University of Malaysia. Dr. Yurika Ishi, National Defense uh, Academy of Japan. Dr. Kamal Din Ali, Center for Maritime Security and Law, Africa. Distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, it is indeed a great honor for MIMA to be part of the 45th Annual Conference on Ocean Law and Policy, theme and clause at 40. I wish to express my appreciation to the Stockton Center for International Law, U.S. Naval War College, <clears throat> excuse me, and the supporters of this endeavor for having me here to address these important sessions of the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia's economy is highly dependent on offshore natural resources and her maritime domain features busy shipping sea lanes of communication. Firstly, there's the Straits of Malacca, which acts as the gateway for the country's trade. The South China Sea, a highly contested maritime area. And next, the Sulu and the Celebes Sea. And lastly, the Indian Ocean, which borders more than three continents. These maritime areas are also rich in living and non-living resources, contributing significantly to Malaysia's economic development. Malaysia is committed to keeping our maritime zones safe and secure from asymmetrical security threat and other ocean-related issues to ensure international trade unimpeded and can prosper. 
the safety and security of the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea are vital to national, regional, and international shipping. To address this, the littoral states in the Straits of Malacca have adopted various national, bilateral, and multilateral security approaches, including the Malacca Straits Patrol. The South China Sea disputes have become increasingly challenging as the nations involved have prioritized their interests over the common desire of regional and international communities to avoid adverse situations on the ground. Because of this, because of the presence and maneuvers of warships cruising in the disputed area or flying over the airspace above, claimants in the South China Sea face asymmetric security issues. Undoubtedly, the South China Sea has been a place where freedom of navigation for military purposes is widely exercised. As a result of this action, the level of insecurity in several states has increased. In this regard, militarily stronger states must avoid using force, intimidation, or coercion in these disagreements. Most significantly, all parties must display prudence in carrying out activities in the disputed territories. Conflict prevention has dominated the agenda on the South China Sea disputes. Although recent developments could potentially alter the status quo in the area. Malaysia's approach towards the issue in the South China Sea is based on the concept of pragmatism and always emphasizes that disputes should be settled through peaceful means, using rule-based approach and universally recognizing principles of international law, such as UNCLOS 1982. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sulu Sea and Sulawesi Sea are in the Southwest Pacific Ocean, where Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines share the tri-border sea area, TBSA. This area forms an alternative route to the Straits of Malacca, as it is the only way only seaway in the region capable of supporting submarines and super tankers. The tri border sea area is exposed to many non traditional asymmetric security challenges, primarily emanating from non state actors. The security problems have remained highly problematic for law enforcement and the lives of people living in the coastal areas. The porous borders and close geographical proximity of about 10 nautical miles between Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines exposes this area to criminal activities with illegal immigrants and illegal fishing activities being the main irritants. The three border states initiated the Trilateral Cooperative Agreement, also known as the TCA, in 2016, complete with air and sea patrol components. There are also maritime coordination centers in the three states. In the border geographical context, the Indian Ocean is a crucial shipping lane linking the East and the West and facilitates much of the world's container trade and oil seaborne transportation. It also facilitates various economic activities such as fisheries, port operations, shipbuilding, ship repair, and marine tourism. Malaysia is connected to the Indian Ocean via the Straits of Malacca, a key shipping lane between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. The volume of seaborne trade moving via the Indian Ocean and the Malacca Strait is enormous. Malaysia has been participating in a strategic partnership with other Indian Ocean countries, primarily for regional, naval, and coast guard collaboration under the ambit of non-military maritime cooperation to maintain security in the Adaman Malacca Strait Link at the northern entrance of the Strait of Malacca that approaches Peninsular Malaysia. 
the Indian Ocean Rim Association, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, and the Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem are all part of this. Malaysian participation in the Indian Ocean Rim Association through the National Secretariat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs focuses on efforts to build the association's agenda in the context of a strong economic and business perspective. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia, MIMA, was announced as a center of excellence for training and exchanging expertise on maritime related issues by IORA member states. Ladies and gentlemen, asymmetric maritime security issues are diverse, particularly in disputed waters. It ranges from both conventional threats to states, to non-conventional risks, to the law enforcement agencies and the life of coastal population. The challenge is more pronounced today in the era of the pandemic additional resources, assets, and funding need to be equally distributed to deal with the wide range of challenges. As such, security governance is more complicated and requires a delicate balance between priority and need. In such circumstances, the government may want to pay attention to the most urgent security issues. In the case of Malaysia, it is to deter the illegal arrival of boat people, the illegal encroachment of foreign vessel, fishing vessels, the illegal intrusion of foreign vessels and aircraft. In this respect, an ocean governance regime for Malaysia and overarching policy and security, safety, economy, and the environment are paramount. Malaysia believes that maritime security efforts would only be effective when working together with its neighbors. One of the key issues to be addressed in maritime security would be the capability and capacity of states in facing maritime security threats. This is where capacity building efforts and technical assistance from more advanced regional and international partners could be focused and to ensure a security maritime domain for various economic activities, which can be achieved to, through track 1.2 or two forums. I am glad that the Maritime Institute of Malaysia, MIMA, pledges its commitment to facilitate dialogues on a wide array of maritime affairs in order to maintain a stable maritime order in the region through many research activities and forums conducted by the Institute. The deliberation at this conference, therefore, is important to foster ideas among policy planners and international experts to support Malaysia's maritime nation aspiration and in promoting her role as a major contributor to the agenda of the international maritime community. With that, I thank you for your participation and look forward to the volume and breadth of deliberation on the next session of the conference. Thank you. Over to you. I would like to thank Dr. Muhammad Sufyan Awang for his informative and timely keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, session eight will be starting at eight o'clock. In the meantime, we have some time before the next session. Can we please have our um, have our speakers please take a break before the next session. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen. We'll be continuing with the eighth session in about five minutes. Thank you. Hey, Alif, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Tara, how are you? I'm fine, can you hear me? Yep, yep I can hear okay, you. Cool. Sounds a bit distant and you get uh, closer. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Okay. I think there's the background music on, which is why. Yep, so we'll end that. Ronan, how are you doing? Uh, uh, great to see you, uh, Professor Beckman. Congratulations on your uh, appointment on, on part of Vietnam, as well as your elevation as Emeritus Professor at the National University of Singapore. So very nice to see you uh, Good online to see and you. Hopefully, hopefully in hope person to, shortly. I hope to see you in uh, WMU one of these days. Uh, Prof, you're gonna, he's coming to Singapore, Prof. Ah, week. yes, you're coming soon. A week on Sunday. Okay, well, let's hope we don't have another uh, lockdown before then. Uh, <laughs> but I think things are fairly well under control here. Okay, I hope so. Looking yeah, forward. we look forward to seeing you guys. Yeah, it's going to be wonderful. And uh, you've a great set of papers in this session, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, let's hope we do a good job. Uh, final session before we go to Michael, huh? Yeah, it's been good. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't be able, wasn't able to just watch the last two nights, but good reports. If all our if all our speakers are in, are we okay to start the next? All session? the speakers are in. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope everyone enjoyed the previous session entitled "Asymmetric Security Challenges in Regional Disputes." The eighth session is entitled "Emerging Challenges to 1982 UNCLOS and International Law." 
the Maritime Institute of Malaysia is pleased to present our moderator, Professor Robert Beckman, Center of International Law, National University of Singapore. Let me introduce the chair. Professor Robert Beckman is an emeritus professor at the Faculty of Law of the National University of Singapore, NUS. He has been with NUS for more than 40 years and has taught various courses in public international law. He has specialized in ocean law and policy and in international regulation of shipping. And he currently teaches a course on international regulation of global commons. Professor Robert Beckman was a founding director for the Center of International Law, SEAL, University Level Research Institute at NUS. And he is currently the head of SEAL's Ocean Law and Policy Program. He is also a senior advisor to the Maritime Security Program of the Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies at Nanyang Technological University. Professor Beckman is a member of the governing body of the Rhodes Academy of Oceans Law and Policy. He has a special interest in ocean law and policy issues in Southeast Asia, including the governance of the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, and the maritime disputes in the South China Sea. Professor Beckman did his undergraduate and law degrees at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an LLM at Harvard Law School. Professor Robert Beckman, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my pleasure on behalf of the Center for International Law to thank uh, the organizers for inviting us to be a supporting organization. We're very pleased to uh, participate and to organize this panel. We hope that we've been a supporting organization for the uh, COLP for many years, and we hope it will continue now that it's moved to the Stockton Center. So thank you, James, and thank you, Mima. We're Unfortunately, we can't meet you in Kuala Lumpur, which we hoped we would be able to do, but uh, I think Zoom will be the best we can do. I won't spend time on the uh, CVs or introducing the speakers. I think we'll move quickly right in. I'll say just a very brief uh, few words about each of our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Tara Davenport, who has been with the Center for International Law since we were established in 29, I think it was. Uh, she received her PhD from Yale University. She's now an assistant professor at the uh, NUS Faculty of Law, as well as a uh, senior fellow with the uh, Center for International Law. Tara is going to be speaking to us on cyber attacks against submarine cables. She's also working with the ILA committee on this particular topic. So Tara, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Prof Beckman, for that kind introduction. And thank you very much to the organizers. Um, I'm very privileged to be here and uh, also very excited to be co-presenting with my uh, two dear colleagues, uh, Pia and Daoun. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep, okay, great. I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. Um, okay, there you have it. Okay, can you see my, my screen? Yes, okay, great. Okay, um, well, my uh, topic is a little bit different from what um, uh, Prof Beckman said, but Along the same lines, I'm talking about intentional interference with submarine cables. Uh, is it time to update the law? Uh, I love to show this map. Um, it's from uh, Telegeography, and it's really it's a really great map to show how interlinked we are uh, through submarine cables. Uh, you can see it crisscrossing the uh, various jurisdictions. Um, since the first submarine cable was laid in uh, 1850 submarine fiber optic cables, which are the uh, successor to submarine telegraph cables, have emerged as one of the most important innovations of our time. 98% of the world's telecommunications are transmitted through fiber optic cables. Uh, as of 2021, um, approximately 464 cable systems transmit dozens of terabytes of data per second, crisscrossing vast expanses of seabed and traversing different jurisdictions until they reach a cable landing station on shore. These submarine cables facilitate a wide variety of services that we take for granted. Um, for example, the internet, banking, I'm able to communicate with you because of the submarine cable, email, and uh, very important to my teenagers, social media. 
Um, they have unsurprisingly been described as critical communications infrastructure and vitally important to the global economy and national security of all states. While fi fiber optic cables are used primarily for transmission of communications data, they are also used for other purposes. For example, militaries depend on fiber optic cables for both defense and warfare purposes, Oil and gas industries utilize them for platform connectivity and the placement of scientific sensors on such cables facilitate oceanographic data collection. Um, I put here some statistics. Uh, there are estimates that 59% of cables are privately owned. Um, the 19% uh, are state owned uh, and 19% have both state and private ownership. I think this is important to remember. Cables are not like vessels. They are not flagged. Uh, they're often owned by a consortia of companies, um, although I, I put here the majority of, um, uh, of cables seem to be owned by single owners. Right, so I'm talking about um, intentional interference with submarine cables by states. I'm not uh, extending my remarks to non-state actors, um, and I'm uh, extending it to both physical means and cyber means. Uh, physical means, of course, can be done by specially equipped submarines, uh, you, uh, underwater autonomous vehicles, uh, particularly uh, with developments in modern warfare, or, or ships, right? It's very easy for a ship to drag um, uh, uh, their anchor across some submarine cables and cause damage, right? And of course, cyber means, right, through the virtual world, whereby state-sponsored actors would get control of network management systems that control these cable systems. And the intention of this would be to interrupt or uh, disrupt communications and related functions. Um, you know, I'm sure all of you have been very frustrated uh, when you suddenly see a Wi-Fi is not working. It, it causes a huge panic in my household. Uh, Tonga recently experienced the, um, the sort of devastating consequences of not being able to have access to internet uh, caused by their recent um, natural disaster. So of course, connectivity has become something that we take for granted every day. So the law relating to um, uh, intentional or governing intentional interference by states um, sort of falls into three distinct branches of law. Uh, the law is applicable in peacetime. I put here law of the sea and cyber operations in peacetime. Uh, there's all, there are also laws on when resort to armed force is permissible. Uh, use ad bellum. I have to put some Latin there or else I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but the real question there is, does uh, intentional damage by states to submarine cables constitute an armed attack in international law? And then, of course, you have laws applicable in armed conflict. Um, and here I'll be talking about laws of neutrality and international humanitarian law. Um, because of constraints of time, I'm actually not dealing with the second question and will focus my remarks on both laws applicable in peacetime and laws applicable in armed conflict. So of course we all know, well, sorry, many of the uh, audience will know, be very familiar with the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. Um, and indeed, one of the earliest Law of the Sea Conventions was the 1884 Convention on the Protection of Submarine Cables, uh, the overarching aim of which was to protect submarine cables uh, from damage. Um, it was at that time the concern was fishing. Uh, and again, the 1884 Convention formed the basis for Article 113 of the Law of the Sea Convention, which obliges every state to adopt laws and regulations necessary to provide that the breaking or injury by a ship flying its flag or by a person subject to its jurisdiction of a submarine cable in the high seas or in the exclusive economic zone done willfully or through culpable negligence in such a manner as to be liable to interrupt or obstruct communications shall be a punishable offense. Uh, both Prof Beckman and myself have documented uh, the inadequacy of Article 113, um, uh, you know, there's inadequate implementation by states. States actually base their legislation on the 1884 convention. They impose very uh, sort of minor fines or penalties. Uh, there are limited grounds to exercise jurisdiction. It's confined to flag states and states of nationality. There is a limited applicability. It doesn't apply in the territorial seas uh, necessarily. And it's only confined to attacks or as an intentional interference by physical means. And of course, it does not mention enforcement or interdiction at sea. 
which is uh, something that was actually mentioned in Article 10 of the 1884 uh, Convention, but which was not subsequently incorporated in the uh, 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. So the international law on cyber operations in peacetime. So I take a sort of very broad view of cyber operations. It's you know the use of spy cyberspace to uh, uh, achieve a certain objective, right? But this is still in its very early nascent stages. There's still a lot of this debate and discussion on this. Uh, it's quite piecemeal and fragmented and does not comprehensively address the security challenges posed by cyber operations relation, in relation to submarine communication cables. There's also, of course, the problem of attribution. Uh, who, how do we know who is doing what? It's very difficult to attribute to uh, states and distinguish among the actions of terrorists, criminals, um, and states. Um, I put here in 2015, there has been a UN governmental expert group uh, they recommended that states should not conduct ICT uh, activity that was contrary to its obligations under international law that intentionally damages critical infrastructure or otherwise impairs the use and operation of critical infrastructure to provide services to the public. This is, of course, uh, the use of non-binding soft guide guidelines. Uh, the Talent Manual, of course, is an effort by uh, international experts to come to some sort of a consensus or determination of what the applicable law to cyber operations, both in times of peace and in times of armed conflict. And they uh, acknowledge that infliction of damage to cables by a state is prohibited as a matter of customary international law, since doing so would run contrary to the purpose of the law governing submarine cables. And of course, there's a very um, interesting question, which I did say I would not uh, talk about, but I'll, I'll mention briefly here is the question of whether cyber operation against submarine cable systems intended to disrupt communications actually constitutes a cyber attack. There is no universal definition of a cyber attack. Of course, the 2017 Talent Manual uh, talks about a cyber attack as a cyber operation that is reasonably expected to cause injury or death to persons or damage to uh, or destruction to objects. Now, of course, um, the issue with submarine cables is that uh, cable technology, uh, one of the wonderful things about cable technology is that it allows traffic to be automatically rerouted to other cable parts in the event of damage or fault, right? But that cable may still need to be repaired physically. Um, for the talent, uh, sorry, the talent manual experts, they actually, the majority opined that interference with functionality qualifies as damage so as to constitute a cyber attack if restoration requires replacement of physical components. However, there were a minority, or there was a minority that took the view that any loss of usability constitutes damage that qualifies it as an attack. So you can see differing interpretations of what constitutes a cyber attack. Um, what I, I will now go on to the law of armed conflict. I have um, seven minutes left. I will try and, and speed up. Um, and I think this to me is something very new to me. Um, I only recently started researching it, um, uh, very uh, much um, uh, inspired by uh, Professor James Kraska's article in EGIL. Um, the I sort of have discerned that there are three uh, differing views um, on uh, submarine cables as legitimate permissible targets, whether they are, it is permissible to attack them. Um, and the truth is, of course, uh, cable cutting or deliberate damage in times of war to destabilize the enemy is not a new practice. Um, indeed, Article 8, uh, 15 of the 1884 Convention on the Protection of Submarine Telegraph Cables provides that the rules in the convention do not in any way restrict the freedom of action of belligerents. In 1898, uh, during the Spanish-American War, the United States entered Manila Bay and cut the Manila Hong Kong telegraph cable owned by a British company. Uh, the, there was an arbitral tribunal case, uh, the Eastern Extension case, which actually found that a belligerent is justified in international law in depriving an enemy of the use of the seas by means of telegraph cables. And not only does the cutting of cables appear not to be prohibited by the rules of international law, but such action may be said to be implicitly justified by that right of legitimate defense, which forms the basis of the rights of any belligerent nation. Um, and again, you can see the state practice that occurred in both uh, world wars 
uh, where cables were cut to destabilize the enemy. Right, so the um, international humanitarian law in the form of 1977 additional protocol, right, of course, requires that attacks must be limited to military objectives. Um, cable uh, infrastructure is uh, unlikely to be considered a pure civilian object, considering that it is a dual use object used for both military and civilian purposes. So it may be difficult to mount the argument that it is a pure civilian object uh, immune from attack. The second view, um, of course, and this is, gets a bit more um, complicated and maybe qualifies uh, the idea that submarine cables are legitimate military targets, is this idea, the law of neutrality, right? And um, in, in a series of early 20th century resolutions and statements from naval manuals, um, including from 1907, uh, the Hague Regulations, they recognize this distinction between cables connecting neutral territory and cables connecting belligerent territory. Uh, in the 1995 San Remo Manual, it actually states belligerents shall take care to avoid damage to cables and pipelines laid on the seabed, which do not exclusively serve the belligerent. So you can see again this distinction between belligerent and neutral territory. In the 2017 Talon Manual, uh, the exercise of belligerent rights by cyber means uh, directed against neutral cyber infrastructure is prohibited, right? So again, the talent manual draws a distinction between uh, neutral cyber uh, infrastructure and cyber infrastructure that is located outside neutral ter territory. Um, they defined neutral cyber infrastructure as uh, public or private infrastructure that is located within neutral territory which includes um, the civilian cyber infrastructure owned by a party to the conflict of nationals of that party, or that has a nationality of a neutral state and is located outside of belligerent territory, right? So this raises many questions. Uh, what about cables in the exclusive economic zone or the high seas, but are owned by nationals from neutral states? Would they be protected by neutrality? Um, and uh, again, I will quote uh, Professor James Kraska, Right, the law of neutrality was developed based on actions in the physical domain and at a time when communications only served two states, which were physically connected by that cable. However, because of the complex ownership and control of submarine cables, it will be difficult for belligerents to distinguish between cables that are owned or operated by neutral states or those located within neutral territory. Um, and of course, there may be cases where such cables are owned and operated by corporations from both neutral and belligerent states. So again, there's uh, been much debate about whether the law of neutrality is a feasible way uh, to govern attacks uh, against cables. My last two slides. Um, this is the, view, the, the third view, and, and perhaps it's not a, a Lex Lata, but uh, something I think ought to be developed. Um, submarine cables should not be subject to either physical or cyber attacks. Um, this was reflected in one of the uh, 2020 OSO manual on select issues on armed conflict. Um, it actually distinguished between submarine pipelines and submarine, uh, submarine pipelines, submarine power cables, and submarine communication cables. While submarine pipelines and power cables were legitimate military targets, submarine communication cables whether or not occupying occupied territory with neutral territory may not be seized or destroyed, even if they are serving one or more belligerent states. Belligerent states must take care to avoid damage to such cables unless they qualify as lawful targets. Um, so this is one view which basically highlights the uh, weaknesses of the law of neutrality, right? Data flows in, in so many different directions. It's very difficult to prevent sort of um, uh, unforeseen effects on neutral territory if you do damage a cable. Uh, another argument that has been raised, um, uh, also in an article by um, uh, Tasman Page, Douglas Guilfoyle and uh, Rob McLaughlin, that if even if submarine communication cables qualify as legitimate military targets, they are still subject to the traditional limits in international humanita humanitarian law of distinction and proportionality. This would require at the very least belligerents to identify which section of cable would have a military objective or confer military advantage. And again, they go on to argue that damage to submarine cables and the associated potential impact on loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects would mean that such attacks would not be considered proportionate to any purported military advantage. 
So um, my conclusions very briefly, uh, of course, with the constraints of time, I'm not able to uh, explore this very deeply uh, and just give you a snapshot of some of the issues that occur. Uh, of course, the international law governing states intentional interference with submarine cable systems uh, with the intention of disrupting or halting data traffic is woefully inadequate during both peacetime and in times of armed conflict. And again, I, I do reiterate that both uh, the Law of the Sea Convention uh, based on the 1884 uh, uh, Protection Convention, as well as the laws related to neutrality um, in armed conflict, were really developed at a time when submarine cables were not as ubiquitous and important as they are today. We depend on submarine cables uh, so extensively. Um, and really, uh, I think this is um, very well much illustrated by the recent conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. You can see uh, how much the internet helped uh, Ukraine citizens by um, uh, letting them expose some of the uh, catastrophes that were happening, by letting uh, other citizens from outside Ukraine to donate via Airbnb. This was all because of the internet, right, uh, which is provided the back, submarine cables of, are the backbone of which. Um, like most lawyers, I don't have any solutions, just problems. Um, but I think we've, uh, you know, Prof Beckman and I and, and others have talked about the possibility of adopting international convention. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much appetite for that. Um, there is some suggestion that there should be a development of customer international law whereby states concert, make a concerted effort to refrain from such acts. But again, this is a very long process. And of course, uh, in the meantime, states and cable companies can continue to work together to develop cable resilience to ensure that um, uh, uh, damage, intentional interference by states, by uh, state actors will not have um, uh, unprecedented ramifications. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tara. As chair, let me ask a couple questions first to make a comment. One is that I think we should draw a distinction between military cables that are used by governments such as the United States. I think they would be free for attack in a case of an armed conflict, as opposed to the international telecommunications cables. And I urge those that have never looked at the telegeography map, all you have to do is type submarine cables map on Google and it'll take you there. And you'll see the extent to which many cables are connecting many, many countries. And therefore, it is impossible to cut a cable going into one country without affecting uh, many others that are connected by the same cable. And I think that the other point I would make in terms of background is that the provisions in the current law of the sea were basically the same as those in the 1958 Convention on the High Seas. They weren't revisited in the uh, 80s, uh, 70s and 80s when the Law of the Sea Convention was drafted and therefore they are very, very much out of date. Uh, so I can't see Tara, if you, if you look at the new cables now, they're being, uh, used to be consortiums of telecoms companies. Now the major cables are being laid by Google and Facebook and uh, other major uh, internet providers. Are, and I don't think you could cut a major cable without affecting many other countries that are also served by that cable. So it does raise uh, fascinating issues. And maybe have, there's some questions that have come up on the Q&A. Uh, Prof, sorry, I just wanted to say, um, do you want to go to, so we don't get caught up with the Q&A, do you want to go to Dawoon and, and Pia's presentation we, first? Do, what's, what is the uh, feeling? Should we take all three presentations first and then, uh, Questions for everybody? Uh, Ali, Alif, uh, Bima, what do you think? Um, it's fine if we go through all the presentations first. Before okay, the then let's questions. move to the presentations. Uh, next speaker, uh, happy to introduce Dr. Daun Jung, who is from South Korea. She's a uh, research fellow at the Center for International Law. She did her PhD at University of Edinburgh. And after waiting a long time because of COVID to join us, uh, she's been with us now for more than a year. So uh, Dawoon, uh, you will be speaking on uh, UNCLOS and global health pandemics. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, let me share the my screen.
Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Uh, I see. There we go. Yes, now I see okay. your slides. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a kind word, Prof. And um, it is my great pleasure to be part of this wonderful conference. And thank you so much for giving me a special opportunity to give a uh, to, to, to give a presentation on COVID-19. Uh, yesterday, there were very interesting presentations on COVID-19 and the law of the sea. Today, I'm going to talk about a slightly different issue focusing on crew changes. This is the overview of my today's presentation. First, uh, I will uh, explain the seafarers crisis as an introduction. Second, I will briefly address the international regulatory framework for health emergency preparedness and seafarers rights. And third, uh, I will explain the process of crew changes and then why the crew changes became a very serious issue uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And fourth, uh, I will examine the, how international organizations and shipping industry respond to crew change crisis. It will include the IMO, ILO, and joint efforts between international organizations and shipping industry. And then I will make my own conclusion. Um, so crew changes are vital to prevent fatigue and protect seafarers health, safety, and uh, well-being to and it also contribute to ensure the safety of the shipping. And as you all know that uh, 11 March, 2020, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. And after the declaration, after right after the declaration of the pandemic, the many countries have closed or restricted their ports to foreign nationals, including seafarers, in order to prevent the spread of the COVID virus uh, among their populations. As a result, seafarers are not able to disembark or go home at the end of their contract. So in, and based on the industry analysis, the numbers of the seafarers requiring repatriation after finishing their contract the highest number are around 400,000 in September 2020, and it has decreased a bit, and it has been 200,000 as of March 2021. But still, it means that a number of huge number of seafarers are stranded on, on, on the board uh, beyond their expiry dates of their contract. So before uh, examining the international responses, let me briefly address the international regulatory framework for health emergency preparedness and seafarers' rights. First, the World Health Organization is the UN specialized organization who coordinate and direct the world global health issues. WHO adopted international health regulations in 2005 as the key a uh, global instrument for protection against the international spread of disease. It provides the right of free practice, which is the general rule governing the right of entry of ships into ports. Article 20A, paragraph two, uh, stipulates that ships shall not be refused free practice by state parties for public health reasons. And Article 43 provides exceptions of Article 28 uh, of the free practice, but such measures should not be more restrictive of international traffic. Second, International Maritime Organization is the UN specialized uh, agency to regulate international shipping. And there are a number of uh, conventions are relevant to COVID-19 uh, on the merchant shipping, but with regard to seafarers rights, the 1978 STCW convention provides minimum standards relating to training, certification, and watchkeeping for seafarers. 
uh, international labor organization also very important, uh, in particular Maritime Co Labor Convention, which was adopted 2006, established minimum working and living standards for all seafarers working on ships. So the MLC 2006 is widely known as the Seafarers, right, seafarers Bill of Rights. And Regulation 2.5 provides entitlement to leave, and Regulation 2.4 uh, provides entitlement to leave, and Regulation 2.5 uh, stipulates repatriation. So it provides that 11 months is the maximum period of continuous service by a seafarer on board without leave. So 11 months is the default. Uh, different and very important criteria for crew changes as well. Uh, this uh, diagram shows the process of crew changes. And uh, so the, the crew changes are a very complicated process because there are so many actors involved in this process. Uh, there are labor supplies at the, the main, at the national level, the labor supply states, and port states and flag states are the main actors. So labor supply states are the, the origin, the, the resident of the seafarers place, and they send the seafarers to port states. And port states regulated all the, uh, when they come into port, when seafarers come into the port or when they, when they leave the, the port state to return their home. And flag states regulate the seafarers' condition on board as well as seafarers' employment agreements. And before COVID, uh, the seafarers usually fly to the port states to join the vessel in the port. And then they also use the flight to come back to their home. And labor supply states are, the major labor supply states are usually Philippines, Indonesia, and India. But the problem is that after the COVID, the mass air travel was delayed or almost impossible to use it because of the border control. And seafarers could not come to the port states or come back to the return home. And also because of the border controls at in the ports, they also couldn't join the the, the the ship itself have some troubles to embark or disembark from the ports from the major ports as well. And in addition to the air travel issue, there are additional requirements after the COVID. So as you can see, this uh the the right side. This is the example of the requ additional requirements. So for example, seafarers who are in Philippines, Indonesia, or India uh, from the major labor supply states, they are required to submit the PCR test reports and medical certificate. And then once they uh, get to the port states, then they also need to go through the, all the immigration process and mandatory temperature screening and process. And also, if they are required to do quarantine, then they should transit from the airport to designated facilities, and they should be stayed in the holding facilities for long for a, for a one or two weeks for the quarantine. And then after going having uh, going through the all the additional process, then they can finally arrive at the vessel. So it means that during the COVID pandemic, the all that there are all the additional requirements became a huge burden for seafarers and the ship owners as well. So it became very expensive and it became much more complicated than before COVID. So that's why the so many, so many seafarers are strained at the sea uh, and the, the crew changes became one of the significant issues arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see that this complicated process, there are also 
a number of national agencies are involved in the process, like custom, immigration, and transportation, civil aviation agencies, etc. So this this uh, diagram shows the how difficult crew changes during the COVID pandemic. So let me move to sorry. Let me move to the how international organizations and shipping industry respond to crew changes crisis. First, the, the IMO uh, issued several circular letters to provide guidance to the member states. Uh, right after the COVID, the declaration of the COVID pandemic, uh, on 27th March 2020, the IMO circular letter provides the preliminary list of recommendations for governments and relevant national authorities. Uh, it uh, reconfirmed the importance of the regulation of the relevant regulation and then uh, it uh, strongly uh, urges states to implement the relevant regulations. And fifth, in May 2020, the IMO issued a circular letter entitled Recommended Framework of Protocols for Ensuring Safe Ship, Crew Changes and Travel During the COVID Pandemic. So this is a very important protocols to provide the best practices and guidance. And I will explain this uh, in the next, uh, next slide. In September 2020, the IMO Maritime Safety Committee adopted a resolution and it urged states to consider temporary measures, including waivers, exemption, or other relaxations from any visa or documentary requirements that might uh, normally apply to seafarers. And it also invited states to designate a national focal point on crew change and repatriation of seafarers to coordinate action at the national level. Uh, this recommended framework of protocols for the crew changes are quite important. Uh, and it is very interesting that these protocols focus on ship crew changes involving international travel via aircraft, because uh, crew changes via aircraft is the most popular and most cost effective way. So that's why they focused on the crew changes uh, via aircraft. Uh, and these protocols consist of two parts that seafarers for joining a ship and leaving a ship and repatriation. So I just put uh, extract the part from the uh, protocol. So as you can see this protocol, and it is the, for the joining a ship and it provides step-by-step -step, uh, details. And then, then every step, it provides the detailed measures that the states can adopt or states can uh, implement for the, to facilitate crew changes. And I should highlight, I really want to highlight that these protocols have been developed by shipping industry. So it indicates that shipping industry was moving much faster than international organizations or governments. And the IMO only issued the protocols uh, for crew changes in the form of the circular letter. And IMO Secretary General also made a statement several times regarding the crew change crisis and the importance of the to facilitate crew changes during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and second, the ILO also adopted several uh, resolutions or statement. In December 2020, the ILO adopted a resolution concerning uh, urging member states to establish and implement plans regarding crew changes and it taking into account the IMO recommended framework of protocols for uh, crew changes and it also uh, urged member states to consider temporary measures. Uh, in December 2020, the special trip uh, party committee made a statement to increase the collaboration between ship owners and charters to facilitate crew changes. In February 2021, the IRO informative notes 
uh, request all states, including flex states, port states, and labor supply states to adopt necessary measures to facilitate crew changes. There are also joint efforts between international organizations. Uh, international, a number of international organizations issued a joint statement, a statement on COVID uh, then uh, to call on all government to immediately recognize seafarers as key workers and to take swift and effective action to eliminate any obstacles to crew changes. Uh, and this designation of key workers have been repeated in a number of uh, instruments which were adopted afterwards. But still, it is a very it is a questionable whether the designation of designation of seafarers as key workers have the practical effects, because some some states. Uh, designated seafarers as uh, key workers, but still they impose very restrictive requirements for the crew changes. And in addition to responses of international organizations, shipping industry was working so hard for to facilitate crew changes. And the Neptune Declaration on Seafarer Wellbeing and Crew Change is also the one of the results from the industries work, and it was signed by more than 850 organizations, and it outlines the main actions for the crew change. Uh, so again, it recognizes seafarers as key workers, and it uh, recommends to establish the standards, and it recommends to increase collaboration between ship owners and charters, and to ensure air connectivity between key maritime hubs for seafarers. So having, so looking at the older responses of international organizations and shipping industry, but the, the older instruments adopted by the IMO or ILO do not have any legally binding effect. And the declaration of the uh, key workers also have the uh, it's have, have not practical effect to solve the crew change crisis, and still, even though the I the shipping industry proposed to develop the protocols for the crew changes, but still, several states have have the different requirements for the crew changes, which make the ship owners have much 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 more burden to follow the, all the different requirements for depending on the different ports. So my conclusion would be then how to facilitate crew changes during next global health emergencies. Uh, I feel like I uh, there are several, of course, there are several issues uh, during the COVID-19 in the merchant in the regulation of the merchant shipping, but I feel like crew changes is the one of the examples to show the lack of the cooperation between international organizations and national agencies. So uh, I would like to conclude that there is uh, the international agency cooperation at global and national levels are very, very important. And there is a need for mechanism to facilitate cooperation among the relevant UN agencies to develop the best practices and to implement them. The IMO is the UN special organizations responsible for the regulation of international shipping. And WHO can contribute to develop the measures to exemptions or exemptions or medical certificates or, or medical issues of the seafarers. And ILO can be responsible for the seafarers issues. And ICAO also can work for contribute for the air connectivity issues in terms of the crew changes. And this is also can found in the uh, this the cooperation, the need of the cooperation can be found in the joint statement, which was adopted in February 2020. And government, industry, in collaboration with international organizations, need to scale up the common efforts to limit 
the effects of emerging variants on crew changes while safeguarding the health and well-being of seafarers and global communities. And there is also need to cooperation at the national levels. So as I showed the diagram before, there are so many different national agencies involved in the crew changes and cooperation at the national level is also the key to solve the crew change crisis. And there is also need to establish the best practices in cooperation with the shipping industry and the seafarers unions. So if we have the common pr the practices can be applied uh, in the different countries. And if they the practices are consistent enough, then this can be less burden for ship owners and then ship uh, seafarers to fulfill this requirement. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, Dawoon. We'll save the questions until after our final speaker. It's now my pleasure to ask uh, Maria Pia Benosa, who's been with CIL for a little more than a year now. She hails from the Philippines, and she has been working on unmanned ships and maritime security. So Pia, take over. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, and hello to everyone. Uh, thank you very much to our MIMA colleagues for assisting me with the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure to, to be the last speaker, uh, last panel speaker for, for the conference, and um, so please bear with me. Uh, my interest in the subject really arose from our work at the Center for International Law led by Professor Beckman and also along with uh, Dr. Daun Chung. On, uh, on how the, the topic of maritime autonomous uh, surface ships uh, has been evolving uh, in the last uh, few years. I also had uh, the opportunity to, to present uh, this on this topic at the recent alumni sessions of the Yosu Academy and this current presentation builds on, on, on that exchange that I had with other scholars. So it's uh, interesting for me to note that in the other panels of the conference, there has been a lot of reference about subjects that were not in the minds of the negotiators uh, at the UNCLOS uh, 40 uh, plus years ago. And definitely uh, the, the, the subject of unmanned and autonomous ships is among those topics, those new, uh, new issues in the law of the sea. Uh, and for today's purposes, I may end up using the terms unmanned and autonomous ships interchangeably, but uh, please note that I, I, I could be referring to, to, to the same uh, concept uh, as the, the law on this or the understanding of how exactly uh, these types of new devices or vessels or vehicles are, uh, are separated from each other is not very clear yet. Next slide, please. So I think I'd start with a rundown of some of the recent developments, uh, foremost of which is the completion of regulatory scoping exercises uh, at the IMO on mass or maritime autonomous uh, surface ships. And in a way, I think a lot of the thinking and appetite for the advent and eventual uh, proliferation of uh, autonomous ships or unmanned ships uh, really uh, came out or was consolidated alongside this IMO process. And this too has been delayed uh, by the pandemic and uh, work has started since 2018. Uh, and now uh, we see uh, a lot of uh, developments and um, uh, updates on what the next steps will be that will be undertaken by the major players. So basically, uh, the approach of the regulatory scoping exercises was to uh, take note of the IMO instruments that may be affected or may affect the operations of mass. And to this end, uh, states as well as uh, industry interest groups uh, took turns in, um, in determining whether the instruments uh, would have to be uh, subject to the application of equivalences or would demand uh, interpretive guidance or would have to be amended or would altogether need a new uh, instrument uh, to accommodate the operations of mass or none at all. Uh, and the RSE framework also involved the identification of four degrees of autonomy, building on uh, existing industry research at the time, from degree one, uh, which are crewed ship with automated processes, all the way up to degree four, uh, which are fully autonomous ships. 
The apparent finding from this process is that autonomous ships can be accommodated within the framework of the IMO conventions, uh, either by amendment or by the adoption of a mass code. And that, that degrees one or two to a large extent pose little to no problem to the current legal framework, while the latter degrees, degrees three and four are more, uh, more, more uh, are going to be sources of complication. Uh, important uh, documents from this process would include uh, the report, the outcome of the RSC for the use of mass by the Maritime Safety Committee, uh, as well as uh, the interim guidelines for trials that are already being undertaken in some parts of the world, uh, among others. So in the slide here, there are pictures of the of the pioneering autonomous ships and operations. Uh, one is the Yara Birkland, which is a zero emission ship that is uh, in Norway. And the other one is the control room for the operation of the VN Rebel, uh, which is a French autonomous uh, ship that was uh, trialed just recently also. Next slide, please. Okay, so the emergence of these uh, unmanned maritime systems also raise questions uh, relating to peacetime maritime law enforcement and their military applications, especially as these vessels or vehicles grow smaller and smaller in size and as more uh, robotics and defense enterprises uh, continue to produce more uh, autonomous and self-sufficient um, systems uh, for longer range missions. So already we see in uh, trade and trade uh, trade news that there are prototypes of cross medium drones, uh, and by that we mean drones uh, that could uh, that could traverse uh, or could be used for both air and sea operations. Uh, in the region, tensions also periodically flare up that involve the use of naval drones and the seizure thereof, such as the 2016 U.S. NS Bowditch incident. Uh, in the Philippine EEZ, and later on in 2020, the capture of an ostensibly Chinese uh, glider in Indonesian waters. So there is also a lot of potential for these unmanned systems to be acquired and utilized by non-state actors. That includes the drug cartels that are the constant innovators uh, with their narco boats or narco drones as well as non-state armed groups and even terrorist groups that can weaponize uh, these devices. And then finally, another recent update was the announcement uh, in February by the French Defense Ministry of its new seabed, seabed warfare strategy, which uh, does explicitly acknowledge the role of autonomous and remotely operated vehicles for strategic competition in the seabed. Next slide, please. So the paramount question really in this uh, discussion is whether or not these emergent uh, autonomous or unmanned, unmanned platforms have a ship or vessel status under the law of the sea. A uh, ship or vessel is not defined in UNCLOS. However, it is narrowly defined in some of the IMO conventions. And some factors that have been considered in early studies, whether for or against the qualification of uh, unmanned systems as ships or vessel would include uh, their size, uh, mode of propulsion, the ability to transport cargo or passengers. Uh, in, the R in the IMO R uh, regulatory scope scoping exercise, questions also came up on how the requirements of uh, being under the command of a master and being under the supervision of trained crew can be satisfied by uh, remotely controlled or autonomous vessels. Uh, some authorities also underscore that it, it could be the vehicle's ability to comply with the rules of the road that should be the definitive factor. Uh, at the same time, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are many, many uh, acronyms by which these systems are uh, referred to, which exemplifies how, uh, how the taxonomy is really growing and how, how it could be a challenge to delineate where a ship or vessel begins uh, and where it stays a vehicle or a, vet or a device or some other kind of uh, system. And um, as for the use of the terms autonomous and unmanned, sometimes uh, 
the distinction or uh, and remote operated vessels, the distinction uh, would be as to whether there is a human involved in the loop, a human in the loop, so to speak. So the regulatory scoping exercises of the IMO focused on the IMO conventions because that is the scope of uh, their mandate. Although some delegations did highlight that there has to be some sort of consultation between the IMO and uh, the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea of the United Nations on how the evolution of uh, vessel status um, in the IMO regime may inform our understanding thereof under the UNCLOS. We know that UNCLOS itself is virtually impossible to amend, although there is accommodation uh, through the provisions on the duties of flag states to accommodate the development of uh, generally accepted international rules and standards under the auspices of uh, competent international organizations like the IMO. Uh, some may argue that discussion, this discussion can be quite academic, since unmanned ships are uh, obviously here to stay. However, it is still important to think about the repercussions of ascribing the labels and definitions be because ship status can be determinative of the rights, uh, including passage rights and obligations that states must observe in relation to uh, those ships. And uh, this characterization will also impact the numerous applications that are there for these unmanned systems. And I list uh, some of them here in the slide. Um, perhaps it is also worth saying that while ship or vessel characterization seems easy enough to, to be uh, ascribed to commercial vessels, uh, because our common understanding of it is developing within the IMO uh, regime, uh, state pronouncements, however, are less uh, uniform on the status of uh, government-owned vessels, and we are uh, going to revisit that in the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So here I just briefly, uh, very briefly outlined some challenges to maritime security, um, and uh, foremost of which is the diversity of interests between the states uh, that are involved, especially coastal states and flag states. For coastal states, the primary interest is effective law enforcement action and their exercise of jurisdiction within res the respective uh, maritime zones and, uh, and a desire to protect against conduct inimical to security interests. For flag states, uh, the primary interest could be said to be the upholding of navigational rights uh, for ships flying their flag and to be able to guarantee safety and security in shipping. Uh, specific to the maritime law enforcement context, some issues that are worthy of uh, pondering over and on which the current literature has already shown uh, quite divergent views are the following. Whether coastal states uh, have the authority to restrict passage or whether coastal or, post, co coast, coastal or port states have the authority to impose other such requirements. Uh, that could have the effect of restricting passage, uh, such as um, the establishment of uh, ship reporting systems. Uh, one of the operational issues that is also very important is how to communicate with unmanned ships and or their operational controllers. This invites questions such as how can a law enforcer identify the nationality of an unmanned ship and how in the first place will it be alerted to the fact that what the what sh the vessel or the actor that is being dealt with is actually a subject that is unmanned. The another uh, important issue is the role of a remote control op operator and the discussions uh, within the IMO um, show some perspective that such a remote control operator must uh, at least have the status of a seafarer. So that could also have some uh, implications. Uh, also, in terms of um, mar actual maritime law enforcement operations, there is a question of how the equivalences of uh, boarding, arrest, or inspection procedures uh, can be actualized. Uh, we also have questions on the kind of infrastructure that is necessary, uh, whether the our concept of aids of navigation today uh, will, you know, will be sufficient, or by what degree will it have to be updated, so as to to make sure that uh, 
autonomous uh, ships uh, will be operated uh, really safely and securely. And also, all of these uh, beg the question of how real time the information that can be provided and acquired uh, will will uh, will will transcend the the digital and satellite boundaries uh, to to make it all uh, seamless. And how far are we from this uh, this future? Uh, the, furthermore, the impact of unmanned systems on maritime security can also be assessed depending on whether the mass or U USV or UAV, which is unmanned uh, underwater autonomous vehicle, has the role of an offender or law enforcer. Um, I have five minutes left, so maybe uh, some of these issues can be uh, discussed in the Q&A, but suffice it to say that there will be different implications when uh, when the autonomous system is being used on either uh, side. And some of them are in the, in the list here, such as uh, the degree to which the, the force can be used in maritime law enforcement, questions on accountability and attribution, as uh, we were given a preview by Tara earlier, this is uh, quite uh, an issue and uh, quite uh, a challenge to, 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 to be certain about. Uh, when we are dealing with uh, cyber uh, in the cyber domain, as well as finally the conduct of hot pursuit. Um, offenses in uh, the exclusive economic zone and high seas areas under the UNCLOS uh, are also potentially an issue. Uh, Professor Anna Petrig uh, pointed out in her work that there is an interpret interpretive task at hand, especially when it comes to uh, the definition of piracy under the UNCLOS and the rights of visit and the right of hot pursuit uh, because uh, ostensibly piracy requires or textually says that uh, the offense is committed by the crew or the passengers of a ship and uh, as to the right of visit and right of hot pursuit, the, these are traditionally only carried out by ships that are warships. Uh, or which are clearly marked on being government service and authorized as such. And that does take us back to the ship versus uh, ship or vessel or something else conundrum. Uh, and then uh, intelligence systems and cybersecurity that's outside of today's, uh, the scope of today's presentation, uh, but it is uh, another angle of uh, maritime security. Um, next slide, please. So speaking of warships and other government vessels, uh, there is a question of whether unmanned systems when operated by naval forces or otherwise in non-commercial service are warships or auxiliaries. The apparent difference being that auxiliaries are not uh, explicitly required by the UNCLOS to be manned by a crew. And there are widely divergent uh, views on this issue and the, the, the bottom line uh, when there is an issue of warship or warship or auxiliary status uh, or non-warship status is the issue of sovereign immunity. And uh, it's really an issue of uh, uh, the fact that while it is easy to accord warship status to one's own autonomous uh, vessels or unmanned, unmanned systems, uh, UNCLOS requires that the sovereign immunity of foreign counterparts should also be upheld. So, um, that could be tricky as, uh, as applied to the earlier examples that I gave of the USNS Baudish incident and the, the Indonesian uh, example uh, where uh, we, we see two different sides of the coin. Uh, still, we can say that whether as warships or auxiliaries, there, there are nevertheless, uh, uh, they are nevertheless sovereign immune property uh, that are exempt from the exercise of jurisdiction by another state. However, it, this, uh, this analysis does go back to the question of whether uh, the vehicle or the vessel involved or the device involved has at the very least ship status that entitles them to their own passage rights. So I guess um, it's, uh, we can also by extension say that vessel status, warship status, uh, would have implications on the use of force, not just in maritime law enforcement, as was stated earlier, but also in the UN uh, Charter prohibition sense. Um, we have discussed in the previous panel 
uh, the dichotomy between uh, maritime law enforcement and military activities. So I will not uh, delve into that, but uh, the use of uh, these vehicles and devices uh, during peacetime uh, could uh, could could um, uh, could give rise to that kind of inquiry again. Uh, and uh, just to further extend that argument, uh, the application of uh, these kinds of um, vehicles, vessels, devices, unmanned systems in gray zone warfare, uh, they are being used for swarm tactics uh, already. Uh, and um, that, that could be another uh, aspect of um, the use of force issues. So next slide, please. This is my final slide. I will be very quick about it. Um, I just like to say that it's it's very incredible to see that UNCLOS is really a living instrument, uh, given how, what kinds of issues we're tackling today. Um, and the possibilities are endless for uh, unmanned systems, um, not just in maritime security, but also in scientific research. Even the way we interact with uh, BBNJ uh, could be influenced by the changes that this could introduce. We also have an opportunity to develop uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, fleets, uh, which could benefit our uh, fight against climate change. Um, but at the same time, there will be growing pains for this, um, not only because of uh, not not only because of the human element. For example, I'm from the Philippines, and we are a labor sending state, and this could potentially impact uh, or require a need to, to transition this, uh, this sector of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Philippine economy, for example. Uh, but at the same time, uh, because of the contribution of uh, unmanned systems to intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities, immense advantages could be had for developed countries but prejudicial to developing states and could widen both the economic and security gaps of those, uh, of those groupings. So I will end with that. Thank you very much uh, for uh, the opportunity to present. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all three speakers. Not sure we can get through all the questions, but I'll try to hit a few. Tara, the first one, a couple for you. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. We understand the importance of cables. We've seen that countries have been severely affected by internet blackouts, either by natural causes or deliberately during war. We've seen Elon Musk sending his Starlink satellites to Ukraine, also to Tonga. Can this uh, be considered the next step in internet connectivity? Okay, uh, thank you very much for the questions, really great questions. Um, before I answer that question, I wanted to just respond to Prof Beckman's point about distinguishing between military and civilian cables. Um, and I do acknowledge that there are cables purely designated for military purposes, but I have read recently that um, uh, you know, some states, for example, the United States, a significant percentage of their military communications are transmitted over civilian networks. Um, and again, are belligerent states really able to identify uh, which cables are pure military cables or which cables are dual use? Um, and again, I would also say that the Talon Manual, um, and I, oh, I reiterate that Talon man Manual is the um, opinions of experts and does not necessarily reflect international law, but it has also stated that cyber infrastructure that is used for both civilian and military purposes meets the um, requirement of military objective. Um, so that's the point about uh, military purposes. The second point I wanted to, the satellites, um, I mean, it would be great if there were 100,000 Elon Musk's in the world, uh, right? But the uh, I think the reality is, and I, I stand to be corrected that um, satellites really only provide a, a very small percentage of telecommunications and are really used only in um, uh, the last resort. They are very expensive. Uh, you know, uh, it, it requires a lot of bandwidth, a lot of expense. Um, so I'm not sure to what extent they can actually be relied upon in relation to um, uh, providing the reliability and the services that submarine communication cables do. 
Uh, Prof, did you have anything to say to that? Yeah, I think my understanding is he wants to put up thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, but for, for two purposes, mainly to serve areas that are not served by submarine cables, rural areas in large countries or small island states like uh, Tuvalu or so on. But it's not in any way attempt to replace the importance of the submarine fiber optic cables. So that, that is not the wave of the future, it's filling in. Uh, it raises other issues. Uh, the second question to you, Tara, was most cables are owned by consortia would not, uh, and would not be exclusively owned by a belligerent. What, anal what, analysis, what analysis would you apply if another belligerent destroyed such a fiber optic cable? Okay, thank you again. That's a very good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer, um, but very happy to hear from uh, Prof Kraska and uh, Prof Beckman. I would say that it seems as if the, um, <clears throat> the older regulations like the Hague regulations determine neutrality by virtue of the territory that cables were connected to. Uh, and, you know, uh, San Remo um, uh, Naval Warfare Manual says that cables on the high seas could be cut off if they do not exclusively serve the belligerents. But um, if they don't exclusively serve the belligerents, they cannot be cut. Again, can we determine which cable is actually serving belligerent states, considering the uh, multipolar nature of the, the transmission of data? Um, the Talon Manual, uh, which is actually confined to, I guess, uh, uh, cyber infrastructure, sorry, uh, the exercise of cyber rights by belligerent states. Uh, defines neutral cyber infrastructure, not only as those located within neutral territory, but also that that has a nationality of a neutral state and located outside of a belligerent territory. How do we determine, given, as you've pointed out, that the cables are owned by, um, uh, some of them are owned by single owners, but some of them are owned by consortias. Uh, uh, how do we determine what is the nationality of that particular cable? Right? Uh, is it if the corporation is from that uh, neutral state? Does that mean that cable is uh, neutral? I think it's it's very difficult to make these um, arguments. Right? I mean, uh, prima facie, you could uh, maybe make an argument that a, if a belligerent state attacks a cable owned by companies from a purely neutral state, that would breach the law of neutrality. But again, this is, it, it's, it's so difficult to determine. And I, I think that underscores my point that um, we should make the law easier and actually uh, develop a, a rule whereby there, we should not attack um, uh, cables, that they should be immune from uh, attack during armed conflict. And I, I know that I'm living in some weird utopia uh, and the military people will disagree with me, um, uh, but I firmly believe that uh, these are, it is an important um, goal to aspire to. Um, you know, um, two, yeah. Two quick points. One is cables don't have a flag, unlike ships. Yeah. And two, uh, if you just go to the tele the uh, websites, you can see which countries are connected by which cables. And most of the cables are obviously connecting many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, another one on the Ukraine. I think we've covered that. Yeah. Are there environmental concerns relating to submarine pipelines that may be subject to a due regard duty by a belligerent? Tara, you can take that one as well. No, I can't take that one. <laughs> I, I wonder if my co-rapporteur, uh, Danae Azari, is here, uh, which she could very easily answer this. But um, I mean, you're absolutely right, right? I mean, again, pipelines are considered legitimate military targets. Um, uh, you know, if they are destroyed, the the um, the implications to the marine environment are, are significant. Um, I have to say that I am I'm not as familiar as I should be uh, about the obligations relating to the environment in times of armed conflict. I think there's a real developing um, scholarship on that. Um, so I can't. Uh, I, I mean, I would hope that they have some. You know, it would be subject to at least some limitations, such as proportionality. Uh, distinction, and that would be um, the limit uh, uh, I would assume that would apply. Um, but I, I have to confess that I, I don't know too much about this uh, particular area. Okay, let's move on to questions to Dawoon. Uh, the first one with respect to seafarers, the international community is uh, quite slow to adapt. 
Is there a need for an international body with emergency status to address ongoing maritime labor issues that affect global trade? And the bracket is outside of the ILO. Uh, I would say uh, maybe we can consider to establish the working group because uh, seafarers have so many issues during the COVID-19, but there is a need to cooperation with the other international organizations because they have the sp uh, it is uh, they are many very complicated issues and they are the a lot of issues are overlapped and they need the cooperation and collaboration so outside of ILO maybe working group with the different organization uh, with ILO IMO WHO ICAO can be possible okay good next question is from Jonathan Odom hello Jonathan uh, have there been any additional developments of these protocols for seafarers given the availability of COVID testing and vaccines? The rest of society has adapted in which routines have been improved with the testing of vaccines. Has the shipping industry and the IMO adapted over the past year? Uh, thank you for the question. In fact, um, the IMO uh, constantly adopted the resol uh, resolutions on the uh, two urgent tests to pr prioritize affairs in the vaccination and vaccination programs, and it is in line with the designation of the keys uh, of the key workers. But the resolutions are not legally binding, so IMO is working to uh, to push the states, but still the vaccination program is within the national interest. But um, after, uh, but in the middle of the COVID crisis, this, a few countries started to give the vaccination to foreign seafarers. So like Singapore is the front runner, and then other European countries started to uh, give the vaccination to foreign seafarers. So I feel like it's like a bit development than the nothing. Yeah, let me add one point. At one point, the, the shipping industry was trying to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but for political reasons, they were not able to do so. And that raises the problem with the, with the two vaccines are required for most. And if you could, one port does it, then the question is, we don't know whether the, see, the ship will be going to another port where they could get the second uh, and there have been other issues, but uh, the industry and the major ports are trying and, this, and the uh, labor supply states trying to address this issue, but it's very difficult, again, because of the different regulations in all the countries. Uh, can I can I add something? So sure. as for the, the vaccine, uh, of the COVID vaccine, the only states can the get get the vaccination vaccines. So the, so ship uh, shipping industry, uh, that provides a, a number of guidance of vaccination program, but still they can't to get the vaccines from the the vaccine companies. So this that that can be just a guidance. Okay, wonderful. That takes care of you. Moving on to uh, Pia. Uh, wonder if you have also have also been considering the challenges that unmanned maritime vehicles could pose to scientific research, particularly with regards to the launch and recovery from shore and or of launch and recovery from a research vessel. Uh Okay. Thank you very much, Luciana, for the question. Um, I have not specifically thought about it uh, like deeply, uh, but uh, right off the bat, I could think that there could be uh, potential issues with regard to what type of scientific research is being done, if it's pure or applied, and uh, unmanned vehicles are used for that purpose. Um, and of course, we know that already they are being used for for data gathering, and uh, and often they make uh, they they are engaged in long range missions, and the data is collected uh, at a at a latter point after their deployment. So that's one. Uh, at the same time, there may be issues about the characterization when they are uh, government owned, uh, same as an offshoot of what I was uh, talking about earlier. Uh, some. Uh, there is no there is no definite uh, state practice or uh, yeah there is no definitive state practice yet on 
uh, on the treatment of government owned uh, vessels. Uh, it's not, I mean, of course, there is special practice of, of certain states, uh, but there could be states that take a different point as to the status of a, an unmanned uh, vessel or vehicle when it's deployed from shore or from a research vessel. You would recall that the earlier studies on this subject uh, would argue for a platform-based determination. So that's good if there is a platform at sea, such as a research vessel, but it could be a, a different kind of treatment when it's the deployment is from shore. So those are the two things that I could think of right now. Next question to you is from Shari Nora. Thank you to the... Uh... Before enforcement, first of all, the coastal state or port state must be able to detect the unmanned vessel, especially underwater vessels or underwater, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, vehicles. The capability detect requires technology access and operations capacity. Uh, we come back to capacity building. Is this correct? Uh, mm -hmm. um, yes, I think. Uh... I think this is very much uh, an issue that is uh, that has been raised also before the IMO proceedings. The idea is that with the computer systems, there will always be uh, a failsafe, and uh, uh, the it will really be up to the flag states to up their game so that they would uh, they would be able to establish uh, jurisdiction over over uh, the remote the, the new concept of the remote control uh, operators and uh, how the coastal the, how I'm sorry how the coastal states or port states could be able to communicate well with this uh, with these stations uh, and the question is uh, whether these stations will be established uh, within uh, the same states uh, or would it be a third states uh, third state uh, so I think it's true that uh, there is a challenge for capacity building. I raised earlier the point that there could be uh, a gap in, in terms of the, uh, the economy, the economic and security implications of, of the advent of uh, unmanned ships. So definitely there is room for, for capacity building. Okay, let me add one point. Article 21, an underwater vehicle has the right of innocent passage, but they must surface and fly their flag. That gives the, uh, that gives the coastal state some degree of protection, uh, uh, different than transit passage or archipelagic sea lands passage. But it is an issue in the, the control or the jurisdiction over the remote control operators from uh, as a again, continuing problem that the IMO is struggling with and uh, states are gonna have to struggle with as well. Uh, okay, another one to you from Raga Manjari. Autonomous ships are highly dependent on computers and other robotic equipment, which could exacerbate the consequences of a cyber attack. There's no crew on board. There will be no possibility of physically overriding a remote or autonomous control. Can it be considered seaworthy? What are the suggestions on precautions needed to be taken by the relevant authorities in the future? Uh, on seaworthiness, I think this is precisely the object of the current efforts uh, before the IMO. Uh, it's it's uh, worthy to note that like in the COVID situation, there is a lot of, uh, there is a huge role for the industry groups that participate in the, in the working groups and uh, within the committee. And uh, to some degree, that really elevates the discussion because um, uh, they are able to, to supplant the understanding of the of, of member states of the IMO of uh, of the technical uh, technical details that could contribute to our idea of seaworthiness as well as cyber uh, worthiness. So I think it's 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 uh, worthy to keep uh, those uh, discussions and the guidance uh, uh, coming uh, from 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 industry. Okay, we've got one more focus more on yours. There's a couple of very general before that. Uh, in your view, how likely are unmanned autonomous vessels will, will pose a threat to the safety of navigation? Uh, and if it will be involved in, a, if an unmanned vessel is involved in a maritime incident, what will be the possible adjudication for this? 
based on existing uh, international maritime laws. Um, okay, so I, the scope of my presentation was really on the maritime security aspect and uh, not much on the maritime safety aspect. But that being said, um, the, the process before the Maritime Safety Com Committee reveals exactly um, how uh, their, uh, their advent into the, into the ski seascape could, could, uh, could pose a threat to the safety of navigation. And of course, the very obvious uh, uh, aspect of that is that it will, there will be no crew on board. So uh, even though one argument that has been raised for the use of unmanned uh, systems and unmanned uh, vessels is uh, that they offer really the absolute uh, safety of life at sea because there is no human element or human life to be to be harmed at sea. Uh, but at the same time, that is also the the, the crucial uh, the crucial question to it, such as um, uh, how do we adapt the rules in SOLAS, for example, so that um, the requirement of having a master and crew on board will be virtually satisfied by the application of uh, equivalences. Uh, and um, that is very much a, a, a development that we have yet to see. So as for the adjudication, I would, uh, I would suppose that um, the usual avenues for dispute settlement will be approved. Okay, yeah, one of the, I'll just add to that. I think one of the issues is the unmanned vessel other vessels are going to have to way to have to have a way to communicate with the unmanned vessel, and coastal states and port states are going to have to have a way to communicate, whether it's with a remote control operator or with a computer. But there has to be some mechanism by which uh, port authorities or coastal authorities could contact that vessel, and the same with other ships. Uh, Another question from old friend Henry Benserto. Thank you, Maria. In the absence of clear and categorical international norms on unmanned vehicles, how should coastal states behave vis-a-vis -vis such unmanned vehicles, given the security implications of such vehicles? Um, thank you for the question. Um, in, a, in a recent series of activities by the CIL, specifically on the topic of, uh, of mass, uh, and unmanned ships, other unmanned ships. Um, this is the, the paramount question, to what extent could coastal states uh, restrict uh, the, the, the passage or the presence of uh, such types of vehicles uh, within their territorial sea? Um, I think, well, I don't have a definite answer, <laughs> but I, I would say that uh, coastal states especially archipelagic states will, as, ha as has been seen in the Indonesian example, would have an interest to exercise jurisdiction whenever there is a, an unwanted presence uh, within their waters. Uh, and it will require uh, uh, a stringent application of, uh, of the provisions on, on passage, on innocent passage and uh, coastal state authority to to provide rules that give effect to generally accepted uh, international standards at the before the IMO or, or at the international level, to be able to say what is the right uh, level of uh, regulation that could be done by coastal states. Um, okay, thank you very much. We've got a couple of minutes left. I think the last question I'll pass to James Kraska. Uh, what constitutes freedom of navigation if a warship transiting through disputed waters transmit her fire control radars and other war warfare gadgets? Can this be construed as a provocation rather than freedom of navigation? Any speakers, please give their views. I thought I'd pass it to James on this one. Uh, well, sure. I mean, it's... Um... <clears throat> it's freedom of navigation and other internationally lawful uses of the sea, which includes gunfire exercises, uh, space launch and recovery, and all of the rest. That, of course, must always be consistent with the Charter of the United Nations, which forbids the threat or the use of, of the aggressive use of force against other countries. All right, and the question, I guess, was disputed waters. The question, where is it disputed territorial sea? The rules are different. If it's disputed economic zone, then the freedom of navigation applies as well as the naval, uh, naval activities. I think we'd agree on that.
Okay, that wraps up our this session, I believe. I'd like to thank all the speaker, all three speakers from CIL. And I also like to thank the audience for some very, very good questions. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank our moderator, Professor Robert Beckman, and our speakers today for their informative presentations and ideas regarding emerging challenges to 1982 UNCLOS and international law. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia is pleased to welcome Mr. Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority to deliver his keynote. Let me briefly introduce the keynote speaker for the session. Mr. Michael Lodge was elected Secretary General on 21st July, 2016 at the Authority's 22nd session. He was Deputy to the Secretary General prior to his election. Prior to this election as Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority, he had served as Deputy to the Secretary General and Legal Counsel. Other professional experiences, including serving as the Legal Counsel to the ISA, Counselor to the Roundtable on Sustainable Development, OECD, and Legal Counsel to the South Pacific Forum Fisheries Agency. Mr. Michael Lodge, the floor is now yours. to thank and congratulate our hosts at the Maritime Institute of Malaysia for their great work in organizing this online event. I also wish to thank the co-organizers, Professor James Kraska of the Stockton Center for International Law at the US Naval War College, Dr. Jong Deog Kim, President of the Korea Maritime Institute, and Dr. Cleopatra Dumbia Henry, President of the World Maritime University for their hard work in putting this year's conference program together, as well as for giving me the honor of making this closing keynote address. Needless to say, I would have much preferred to be with you all in person, but perhaps the only good thing one can say about online events is that it opens the possibility for many experts to join the event who would otherwise not be able to travel. Certainly, this is well reflected in the rich and varied presentations that we have seen over the past two days. The theme of this year's conference is UNCLOS at 40. And in my remarks today, I propose to offer a few observations on lessons learned from our experience in implementing UNCLOS and some of the challenges for the future. Of course, UNCLOS only entered into force in 1994. So as far as the institutions established under UNCLOS are concerned, ISA, ITLOS, and the CLCS, we are only just over 25 years of age. Perhaps we could say that we have just passed our master's degrees and are ready to make our way in the world. Before coming on to the points I wish to make, let me make a few comments about the video you saw at the beginning of this presentation. What you saw is the latest technology deployed to bring live video footage from the ocean floor more than 3,000 meters deep. Today, this space is the frontier for cutting edge marine science, technological innovation, and deep sea exploration. The prospects offered by this new frontier, which under UNCLOS is the common heritage of all mankind, are enormous. The research being undertaken over the last four decades and which has intensified in the last 10 years will enable us to better understand our planet and further develop a sustainable future. The rich mineral deposits found on the seafloor 
and the biodiversity associated with them also create exciting opportunities for sustainable development. UNCLOS established the International Seabed Authority as the organization responsible for managing the vast area of ocean space that is the seabed beyond national jurisdiction. And in this context, the authority represents a unique experiment in civilization. Without the authority, we could easily have seen rampant, unrestrained exploitation of the deep seabed. Instead, we have the benefit of 40 years of carefully managed deep sea exploration, which has massively expanded our collective understanding and knowledge of the ocean at large. So what are the main lessons learned after 40 years? The first is that ocean governance requires effective cooperation. Anyone who has been involved in law of the sea discussions will know just how difficult it is to reach agreement on almost any aspect of the many issues covered by UNCLOS. It requires a level of persistence and patience that has few parallels in international relations. Whilst UNCLOS stands as one of the towering achievements of the United Nations, we should remember that it took 12 years to negotiate after a preparatory process that itself took five years. And on the back of two previous international conferences on the law of the sea, UNCLOS 1 and 2. Even after the adoption of UNCLOS in 1982, it took a further 12 years to build the necessary support to bring it into force. And then only after the adoption of not one, but two implementation agreements. It is important to bear in mind here that when we refer to UNCLOS, we must also consider the two implementing agreements of 1994 and 1995. These agreements must be read together with UNCLOS and interpreted as a single instrument. Each of them introduced important refinements to parts of UNCLOS that had not been sufficiently addressed in 1982. And part of our reflection on UNCLOS at 40 must include a reflection on the success of these two agreements. As if that were not enough, it has taken 25 years to build the institutions established by UNCLOS. As someone who was intimately involved at the foundational stages, I can well remember how difficult it was to decide on the composition of the Council of ISA, elect the Finance Committee, decide on the budget, and adopt the rules of procedure for the different organs of ISA. I can also recall how anxious many people were in the early years about whether the tribunal would receive any cases. It is true that some issues are still pending. For example, the problem of the composition of the Legal and Technical Commission remains a hot political issue. And there are still problems in the way the Commission for the Limits of the Continental Shelf functions. But overall, the story is one of success. ITLOS has demonstrated its capacity to act as a dispute settlement mechanism of first resort with 27 contentious cases and two advisory opinions. ISA has developed a comprehensive set of legislation to regulate deep sea exploration, including for resources that had not even been discovered when UNCLOS was adopted, and is well on the way to completing a comprehensive mining code covering all phases of activities in the area. These successes did not come easily, and the fact that we can celebrate them today is testament to the hard work and commitment of successive generations of law of the sea experts. Sadly, many of the first generation from UNCLOS III are now retiring, and even more sadly, we have lost some key figures over the past two years, including both my predecessors as Secretary General of ISA. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude for their work and vision. The second reflection is that this legal system remains highly vulnerable. Although in many respects, UNCLOS merely codified existing international law, 
It was revolutionary in some respects. The regime for the deep seabed, which lies at the heart of the entire system of global ocean governance under UNCLOS, was completely new. The concept of the exclusive economic zone, which we now take for granted, represented an entirely new vision for resource management. And the 1995 Fish Stocks Agreement overturned 300 years of international law by creating a regime for boarding and inspection of fishing vessels on the high seas. All of this could easily have failed. However, today, this comprehensive governance system has the full and active support of 168 states parties. In the case of ISA, we also have the participation of 94 observers, including 32 civil society organizations. It is critical that we do not take our achievements for granted. It hardly needs to be said that right now, the world is suffering from a deficit of international cooperation and a lack of confidence in multilateralism. Some multilateral institutions have proven too weak and fragmented for today's global challenges and risks. It is in this spirit that the Secretary General of the United Nations, in the context of his vision for our common agenda, focused on the need to strengthen global governance, abide by international law, and renew the social contract to achieve a more inclusive and networked multilateralism. In the case of UNCLOS, there are also continuing and unresolved tensions. One such tension manifests itself in the persistent problem of excessive claims to maritime jurisdiction. Second, as I have discussed at length elsewhere, there is the problem of dealing with potential disputes over the delineation or delimitation of the continental shelf and the spillover consequences of those disputes, including the consequences for the area. And third, despite our two implementing agreements, there remains unfinished business. For example, in the case of regulating access to and benefit sharing from the use of marine genetic resources. These tensions are not helped by the continued absence of the United States from the UNCLOS regime. This absence is particularly unfortunate considering the important contribution made by the United States to the implementation of the international fisheries regime under UNCLOS, including through the 1995 Fish Stocks Agreement. I wish to express the hope that the US Senate will reconsider its position on the treaty as a whole. Recent public submissions by a significant number of retired military officers, as well as a member of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, including in relation to the importance of sourcing strategic minerals, give me some cause for optimism. It would be much better for all of us if the United States were inside the regime rather than on the outside. At the end of the day, it is incumbent on states' parties to protect the gains that have been made over the past 40 years. This includes placing their trust in the institutions that have been established under UNCLOS, as well as supporting them and fully participating in their work. I include in this not only the UNCLOS institutions, but also the competent international organizations referred to in UNCLOS, such as the IMO and FAO, but also the regional fishery bodies. Collectively, these bodies have made commendable progress in reforming themselves and fully implementing the Fish Stocks Agreement, and we should give them credit for this. It is more important than ever that the work of these institutions is supported and not undermined. The third reflection is that much more needs to be done to enable all nations to fully benefit from UNCLOS. One of the primary objectives of UNCLOS, as expressed in its preamble, is to contribute to the realization of a just and equitable international economic order, which takes into account the interests and needs of mankind as a whole, and in particular, the special interests and needs of developing countries, whether coastal or landlocked. The extent 
to which this objective has been achieved is perhaps open to question. And some authors have rightly been critical of the watering down of UNCLOS provisions on capacity building and transfer of marine technology. Taking a more positive approach, I prefer to view the glass as half full and say that UNCLOS is yet to achieve its full potential. Certainly, there is much more to be done in terms of fulfilling the obligations to provide capacity building to developing states parties in relation to activities in the area, marine scientific research, and the development and transfer of marine technology. As we saw in the opening video, new developments in marine technology have the potential to transform our understanding and use of the ocean and its resources, but have the potential also to exacerbate existing inequalities if we fail to fully implement UNCLOS provisions on capacity development and benefit sharing. The need to urgently address these issues is recognized in the ISA strategic plan for the period 2019 to 2023. To better understand the specific needs of developing states, in particular, least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states, in relation to capacity development, the ISA Secretariat convened an international workshop on capacity development, resources and needs assessments in Jamaica in February 2020, and also conducted a survey in which members were invited to identify their priority capacity development needs relating to the role and mandate given to ISA. One of the key outcomes of the survey was that out of those states that were not currently sponsoring activities in the area, 89% indicated that their country aspired to engage in activities in the area in the future and wished to develop capacity to do so. As a result, the Assembly adopted a decision on capacity development in which it requested the Secretary General to develop and implement a dedicated strategy for capacity development and explore options to mobilize resources to provide financial support. This is certainly positive progress in the right direction, and several other organizations have taken similar steps. But good intentions are not enough by themselves. And what is essential now is to ensure that such programs are supported and financed by those states that have the capacity to do so. The fourth reflection is that we need to do a better job to link the law of the sea to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The inclusion of SDG 14, Conservation and Sustainable Use of the Ocean and Its Resources in Agenda 2030 was an important step in the right direction. It is worth pointing out here that SDG 14 places equal priority on conservation and sustainable use. Of course, we need to acknowledge that the pressures on the marine environment created because of our dependence on the resources provided by the ocean are real. They also present a challenge for effective governance and management. But we should also be pragmatic. Millions of people depend on sustainable use of ocean resources to support livelihoods and human development. There needs to be an appropriate balance between conservation and sustainable use. A significant concern in recent years is the call from some to apply the precautionary approach to support abstention and inaction. This radical approach is not what was intended. The precautionary approach was originally intended as a framework for action in the face of scientific uncertainty, not for using an absence of evidence as a reason not to act. Too often, we see that the default position has shifted to an interpretation that prohibits any activity from taking place in the face of uncertainty, which by definition always exists. Scientific advice is important. But science is about presenting a rigorous analysis of what we do and do not know. 
Scientists should expect to inform policy, not make it. It is important also to bear in mind that the SDGs form a holistic package. They should not be viewed in isolation. The UNCLOS institutions, as well as those organizations involved in implementing provisions of UNCLOS, should be encouraged to align their mandates and activities with the SDGs to ensure that they are delivering for all countries. In this regard, an independent report issued a few months ago after extensive multi-stakeholder consultation determined that ISA makes a meaningful contribution to 12 of the 17 SDGs. The 40th anniversary of UNCLOS is an opportunity to reflect on how much has been achieved so far, as well as to look forward to shape future discussions on ocean governance and the sustainable development of the ocean and its resources. We should acknowledge first and foremost that after 40 years, UNCLOS remains the foundation for all human activity relating to the ocean and its resources and is the best guarantee for peace and good order in the ocean. As far as the area is concerned, we have also seen the progressive development of a sophisticated and balanced legal regime, open to equal participation by developed and developing states, anchored in the precautionary approach, transparency and equity, and fully aligned with Agenda 2030. The resounding success of the legal regime for the area offers a concrete example of some of the mechanisms that could be replicated in future to ensure sound and careful management of global public goods. What is important now is to reinforce our collective action to ensure that this framework is respected and reinforced and that the institutions created for its implementation are respected and strengthened and not undermined. Thank you to His Excellency, Mr. Michael Law. We are now towards the end of the program. To this, may I invite to the screen Professor James Kraska, Chairman of the Stockton Center for International Law to deliver his closing remarks. Thank you very much and very nice message from Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. Seabed mining soon may be realized after decades and I share his hope that the United States will have access to shaping and influencing the rules governing conservation and sustainable use of the seabed. I want to thank all the participants, distinguished speakers and moderators, and especially would like to thank Dr. Cleopatra 
Dumbia Henry and Professor Ronan Long of World Maritime University. WMU has been a stalwart uh, uh, promoter of the conference for many years. And likewise, also would like to thank especially Dr. Jong Dog Kim and Dr. Young Kil Park of Korea Maritime Institute, who uh, Korea, Korea Maritime Institute has also been a stalwart uh, promoter and, and uh, sponsor of the conference. Especially would also like to thank Professor Bob Beckman and Nilofer Oral at Center for International Law, National University of Singapore, uh, a very, um, for your sponsorship and then a very powerful um, final session. Thank you so much. And finally, most of all, would like to thank the world-class team at MEMA. Uh, regret that we could not engage in person in Kuala Lumpur, a world-class city, and especially as part of that team, would like to thank Dr. Mohammed Safian Awang, the chairman of MEMA, and to took Dr. Sabrin Jafar, director general of MEMA. In addition to that, I know all of the hard work I would like to acknowledge by Alif Imran Hidayat, Wal Zamroz, Jessalyn Tan, and Sumati Permal that worked tirelessly for literally for months to be able to put together uh, this magnificent event. And last, I'll close with thanking the support of Dr. Hakan Karan of the Ankara National Center for Sea and Maritime Law in Turkey. And we are in discussions with Dr. Karan to locally host the 46th annual conference on oceans law and policy on the coast of Anatolia in 2023. So we'll keep everyone apprised of that and hope to see everybody in person in Turkey next year. Thank you. Thank you, Professor James Krasko. We invite to the screen Ms. Samati Permal, Center Head for Maritime Security and Diplomacy at the Maritime Institute of Malaysia to deliver her closing remarks. Thank you very much, Alif. Um, we have come to the end of the 45th uh, Conference on Ocean Law and Policy, UNCLOS at 40. It's a remarkable uh, milestone uh, for MIMA to be part of this significant event. Uh, MIMA's sincere appreciation goes to uh, Professor James Kraska of Stockton Center for International Law, the United States Naval War College, and also the members, including uh, Raul Pedroza, Commander Michael Petta, and Claudia for their effort. I'm confident that the conference has contributed uh, to the ocean law and policy discourse, addressing most important uh, legal issues during the pandemic 19 and also the ongoing conflict in uh, Europe. The outstanding contribution by the reputable speakers, moderators, and most importantly, the participant, uh, participants are highly appreciated. Uh, once again, uh, merit Time Institute of Malaysia and Stockton Center for International Law and the United States uh, Naval War College would like to thank our co host, the World Maritime University, the Sasakawa Global Ocean Institute, the Korean Maritime Institute, the Center for International Law of the National University of Singapore, the National Center for Sea and Maritime Law, Turkey, and the Japan Institute of International Affairs and most importantly, the Japanese Embassy in Kuala Lumpur. Thank you for your unswearing support of MIMA's research endeavors. Back to you, Ali. Thank you, Mr. Matthew Bermal. The 45th Conference on Oceans Law and Policy has come to an end. On behalf of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia and our partners, we would like to extend our sincere appreciation towards everyone who joined us online during this delightful occasion. With that, thank you for your support. Good evening. And thank you.